How y'all doing? Okay, so this is going to be an, a very interesting uh, stream, and we're going to be talking about the nature and value of analytics and the need to go further in this and how it can drastically change how teams approach team building. So first, a little bit of a background on this subject, right? Advanced analytics are newer in basketball than they are in certain other sports. Obviously, the hallmark of analytics for me is baseball. And what really started a lot of this movement towards analytics is not just a bunch of nerds who didn't know how to play basketball and just wanted to get involved. Rather, it was a complex attempt or a valiant attempt at answering a very complicated problem, which is where do wins come from, right? And, you know, there's a very simple answer to that. It's the guy who scores the most points and, you know, has the most Instagram followers and makes the most money probably is resulting in the most wins. But obviously, this has never really been the case. And regardless of how you feel about advanced analytics, and you know, you can poke holes in John Hollinger's model of PER, and you can definitely hold, you know, say box plus minus doesn't do as good a job of measuring this as estimated plus minus and okay you know, net ratings are heavily flawed and there's caveats here and what is a wind share and all of this stuff. But what I want to do today is I want to take a little bit of a journey through how a casual fan, perhaps, uh, perhaps you, if you're watching this, or maybe, you know, this used to be you, or, or maybe, you know, you know, someone like this, how they attempt to dissect where this complicated question of where do wins come from? Because obviously, you know, when, a, when you are pining for your team to sign a LeBron James, you're doing so with the expectation that signing him will result in more wins. And obviously, more wins, naturally, will lean heavily into, there's a strong correlation, by the way, between winning in the regular season and winning championships. Champions tend to be higher seeds. Champions tend to be winning teams that have dominated throughout the, you know, throughout the regular season. So regular season success can sometimes point us at least vaguely in the direction of championships. And that's what it's all about, right? That's what Nasai Jiri said. It's all about championships, building a championship in Toronto. But is everyone starting out at the same foot? No, they're not. There are small market teams. There are large market teams. There are very wealthy ownership groups. And then there are not so wealthy ownership groups. There are teams that are in cities where there's a tremendous amount of wealth and fan support and then you know you you might look at a espn schedule or an nba schedule and you'd be like you might be like eight dollar tickets in denver or six dollar tickets in detroit when's the last time you saw six dollar tickets in new york or toronto we cannot attempt to even approach this while attempting to fool ourselves into thinking that all teams are equal all teams are not equal all stars are not equal, all management groups and all coaches are not equal. So when we start taking it one step further beyond my favorite player scores more points than your favorite player, we often get criticism. We get critics who are willing to say, well, this doesn't, you know, this is, this is flawed because Rudy Gobert is definitely not a better player than Luka Doncic, and he's beating him in this, that, and this, that. So it's all bullshit. And we've all heard Kendrick Perkins or Charles Barkley, not to pick on those two guys specifically, but they do tend to poke a lot of holes in this. And what I'm trying to say is that advanced stats are in their infancy. What we're trying to do here is in its infancy. In fact, I want to share with you something. I, this is breaking news for the 40, 42 of you who are watching right now. I today attempted uh, to create an advanced stat. Now, who the hell am I and why, what makes me even remotely qualified to do this? Brief bio, literally in one minute. And I want to explain this from the perspective so that you have a little bit of better idea of where I'm coming at this from. I worked at a hedge fund in Boston, and I tested gifted in math in grade five, grade six, grade seven. I've been gifted in math my whole life. And numbers are just how I see the world. Um, this has been a big blind spot for me through most of my life. I have attempted to overcome this by trying to see people as people as opposed to algorithms. But for the vast majority of my childhood, numbers made me feel very comfortable. So obviously, as basketball started to lean more into numbers and analytics, 
I felt very cozy and at home because I thought that I understood the game, but it's impossible to just talk about the game without talking about the analytics. They're everywhere. When we say a mid-range shot is a bad shot, what are we really talking about? We're talking about points per possession. We're talking about points per shot, points per shot attempt. These are all very easy and simple things to figure out. You just need to demystify it, right? So let's start with something very simple, which is me losing my mind in 2000, 2001 as somebody uh, that I was having a debate with in the media space at that point, yes, Trust me, I've been going back and forth to the media since I was a kid. And I was having a debate with someone who said Jerry Stackhouse was Jordan-esque. Now, this was, you know, in fairness, this was Jerry Stackhouse's best season. And I just want to show you why this person came to this horribly, horribly flawed conclusion by pointing to the stats. Now, look at the first row of stats, and you might see that this person clearly had a point, right? I mean, we're talking about a guy, I mean, let's just compare Jordan um, for the 95-96 Bulls, right? Um, and we got 30 points, 29.8 points. That's not that big a deal, right? You got 6.6 .6 rebounds, 4 assists for Jordan. And honestly, if you just leave it there, these numbers are pretty close, right? This is kind of where we were at as, as basketball people in 2000-2001. Allen Iverson is great because he scores 35 points. You know, so-and-so is not great because he doesn't score 35 points. It's just kind of like how it... Oh, that's funny. High Cats TV. Shout out to High Cats, man. Um, so, obviously, if you're going to look at per game, there's going to be a lot of issues with that. Number one, teams do not play at the same pace. Number two, players do not play the same number of minutes. Number three, usage is all over the place. How does a Jerry Stackhouse operate as a second option? Well, we found out when he played next to Michael Jordan. Not well. Portability has to be something that we have to consider. There's so many numbers to look at. But let's just stay on the numbers that this guy was looking at. Because honestly, the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s were dominated by a bunch of guys who put up big numbers on really low efficiency. Took terrible shots, a lot of mid-range shots, a lot of iso ball. Raptor fans should be pretty used to this. That's a lot of how the Raptors offense looks these days. And, you know, some guys managed to do it really well. Jerry Stackhouse is an example of a success story in that sense. This was his best season of his career. And here we have a 30-point-per-game scorer for the Detroit Pistons at the time. And he was honestly great. I mean, if you don't look at the numbers that would perhaps point you in another direction, he was great. But then you start looking at different numbers and the entire argument falls apart. You start looking at steals and blocks. Okay, well, Jordan's ahead there. You look at turnovers. Well, in order to operate at such a high usage and take such a large load, well, Stackhouse is turning the ball over four times a game. That can't be good. Turnovers are bad. There's no stat or algorithm that's ever going to tell you turnovers are good. Free throw percentage, three-point percentage, effective field goal percentage, everything was in Jordan's favor and Jordan played fewer minutes. So you say, okay, well, let's just adjust for the minutes first, and we go per 38, some people, per, per 36 minutes. Well, now the numbers start to edge much more in Jordan's favor, right? Because now we adjust for the three-minute gap or two-and-a-half-minute gap in their numbers uh, on the minutes played, and now we start to see a little bit of a difference, okay? Now, what if I was to tell you that the Pistons are just a faster-paced team? right? And they just simply milked more possessions. So if you play slow, there's going to be fewer possessions, there's going to be fewer rebounds, fewer assists, fewer points, right? If you play fast, you have more possessions every single game. You know, I mean, it's just simple, simple, simple arithmetic. But playing slow should not necessarily, you know, go against the player. In fact, I'd say there's plenty of evidence to say playing slower is less efficient. And so a slower place offense, you sometimes do have to do some creative imagination in terms of understanding how a particular player like a Wilt or a Magic or whatever might operate in a different offense. And we can't really see that because they only play in their offense. But that's what these numbers are for. So once you start to adjust per 100 possessions, now the gap starts to widen even more. Whereas, okay, I mean, now initially we started with not even a point difference, right? And when we get to the minutes, we're at 2.3, 2.3 points difference, right? Just looking at the points. You get to per 100 possessions. Now we're talking closer to five point difference. 
Now go to the advanced stats. And I'm not saying this is the limit to advanced stats, but look at the win shares per 30 uh, per per 48. Jordan is almost three times better player in terms of that metric. In terms of the actual win shares on the season, he contributed 20.4 win shares relative to Stackhouse's 9.2, greater than two times. Box was minus again two times. EPM was even higher. Uh, value replacement almost two times. So when this guy said Mike, you know Jerry Stackhouse in his best season is Jordan esque. Well, here we have evidence that in Stackhouse's best season, he wasn't even half the player that Jordan was as a 33-year-old. The gap is huge. But I'm trying to learn how to empathize with the guy who looked at Jerry Stackhouse's box score numbers every single night, 40 points, 38 points, 32 points, with no real understanding of efficiency, no real understanding of his impact on winning, and just said, you know what? Jerry Stackhouse is Jordan-esque. Six foot six, North Carolina, 30 points per game. That's Jordan esque. I don't blame you if you thought Vince Carter was Jordan esque. I don't blame you if you think Kobe Bryant was Jordan esque. He was not. He was not. And the impact would show it. And I'm not here to say that Kobe Bryant was Jerry Stackhouse level. I'm not saying that at all. But the gap between Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, you may not see it on the regular the regular stats, but when you start to go into the advanced stats, the gap is so big. It's so immeasurably huge. So, okay. Jordan and Stackhouse is one thing. What about Dame Lillard and Fred Van Vliet? A very basic thing, and I'm not going to rehash this, but a lot of people would say that, you know, Fred Van Vliet tries at times to operate in his more ball dominant games like a miniature version of Dame Lillard. He wants to be a primary creator, he wants to take deep logo threes. And honestly, I mean, the gap is pretty large between these two players, right? Like we're, we're literally talking across the board. He's two and a half to two times the player almost in everything, right? Um, but he's also paid two times as much. And I think that that's where I think we need to talk about value, which is really what this podcast is going to be about, which is where do wins come from and how can a team effectively craft something that is going to make them more likely to get wins. So before I do this, two things. One, I was working on an advanced stat of my own today. I started thinking about what about young players, like what is the ideal development pipeline for young players? What's a good situation? Is Jabari Smith Jr. in a good situation in Houston? Or was Scotty Barnes in a good situation last year? Lower usage, more wins. Um, was Anthony Edwards in a good situation? Is LaMelo Ball in a good situation? There's all these, you know, high lottery picks or, you know, good players in bad, good, different situations where, and, and there's a great growing debate about whether or not you want a team to be competitive for young players, or if you want to get young players reps. In rare cases, you're able to get young players reps while winning, which is what you got with Scotty Barnes last year which is what the Cleveland Cavaliers got with LeBron James. You know, typically generational rookies are going to impact winning. Obviously, Scotty Barnes is not the reason that the Raptors were really good last year, but he's a reason that they were good last year. It's very rare that young players impact winning. But I do want to talk about assets and asset valuation after I talk about this. So I tried to create a stat um, and it was really, it was an interesting thing and this is so in its infancy stages, but I just want to, get your mind going in terms of how this could look or how this could work. And I will perfect this and probably at some point publish this and get a Nobel Prize. I'm kidding. Don't worry. I'm, I'm totally joking. So I look at three numbers, right? Number one is usage, right? Um, specifically how much you handle the ball, how much you shoot the ball, how many turnovers you get, all that stuff compiles into one single thing, which is a usage percentage of possessions. So Kate Cunningham, for instance, had a 27.5% usage. Scotty Barnes had a 19% usage. This gap in usage obviously is going to result in more points, more assists, et cetera, et cetera, for Cade, which is what voters hopefully understood last year when they voted for Scotty as rookie of the year, is that he simply didn't have as many creation opportunities as Cade. Now, just because a guy gets more assists doesn't always mean he's a better passer. A lot of great passers that get four or five assists a game lot of kind of terrible passers to get seven, eight assists per game. Again, usage is going to bump up a lot of stuff, right? Including assists, including points. 
Now, <clears throat> the second stat I looked at was what percentage of available minutes did the player play? Now, this is, I think, interesting because you sometimes have players who get buried on the bench, like a Delano Banton. How much is not playing right now hurting him versus how much is it helping him to learn, right? Um, and again, this this entire you know thought process was sparked by this concept that the Raptors' young players are no longer getting better. They were getting better before. How come they're not getting better now? Jakob Pertl developed, Delon Wright developed, Norm Powell developed, but Malachi Flynn, Delano Banton, these guys aren't developing at the same pace that we're used to Raptors young guys developing. So what's gone wrong? So I wanted to boil it down to a single number. The third number that I looked at was um, the win percentage of the team. So in the case of the Detroit Pistons last year, it was a 28% win team. For Scotty Barnes, it was a 58.5% win team. So the formula was simple. You multiply the usage um, by the decimal, by the decimal. So by by the win percentage of the team, by the percentage of minutes that the player played. So Cade Cunningham, due to injuries last year, played 53% of the available 82 games times 48 minutes, which I think boils down to 3,000 something number of minutes. Scotty Barnes played 66% of the available minutes. A player cannot play more than 48 minutes. I mean, yes, technically they can because of overtime, but we're not factoring that in. Kwame Brown, for instance, in his rookie year played 20.7% of the available minutes. Obviously, no one is going to play 100% of minutes, but this is just to keep things somewhat static. Um, so these are the, and then I boiled it all down to a single number that we can use and I call it the development curve number. I haven't come up with a number of it yet. And honestly, this is going to, this is so in its infancy right now, but I just want to open this up to you guys so you can see where I'm going with this. So per this metric, here are the scores for the following players. I'm going to go in ascending order. So I'm going to start at the bottom. No surprise here. Dewan Blair is the okay so these are the, these are the players that i looked at james harden franz wagner dewan wagner chris weber lebron james michael jordan anthony edwards kwame brown scotty barnes and Cade cunningham so in order does anyone have any guesses on who was the worst um and who was the best any guesses we got 50 we got almost 60 people in here um, let me know if you, if you have any guesses. So the worst by a hair was Dewan Wagner. His development score was 1.72. Okay. This is not out of anything. Just like Vorp is not out of anything. Just like box plus minus is not technically out of anything. It's just, it's just a number. Um, this is based on 23.8% usage him playing 35% of minutes and uh, the Cavaliers that year, that was the year that they drafted LeBron James, um, the year before they drafted LeBron James and their win percentage was abysmal at 20.7. Completely different. So he had high usage, modest minutes on a terrible team. Kwame Brown is next. Who is Dewan Wagner? Uh, Dewan Wagner was a very hyped prospect who was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2002. Um, he was one of the most talked about high schoolers in the country. His son is actually a really good basketball player now. Um, <laughs> that's funny, Daryl. Yes. So Kwame is next. With an 18.6% usage, he ends up with a 1.73. So just inches Dewan Wagner out. Any guesses on who is third? Third place is Franz Wagner with a score of 3.5. Fourth place is Cade Cunningham with a score of 4.08. Um, and this is mainly due to usage. So Cade's real advantage over, over Franz was just usage. Um, number five is Harden with 5.46. Uh, he played on a team that had a 60.9 win percentage and he played 44 percent of the minutes available because he was coming off the bench and they brought him along slowly and he had a usage rate of 20.4 um next up oh sorry before harden was anthony edwards with 5.05 he was really screwed over by covid the shortened year 
I continue to use 82 games as a baseline, even though that season was shortened down to 72, because I think playing in a season that had 10 fewer games is a hindrance to development, but open to debates there. Um, then next up, we have Scotty Barnes with a score of 7.33. Then next is Chris Weber with a score of 8.93. Then is LeBron James with a score of 9.52. And then finally, uh, topping the list, no surprise, Michael Jordan <laughs> with a score of 14.07. He had a usage rate of 38%. Um, he played 78, 79.8% of the minutes. So he played a ton of minutes. He was perfectly healthy and his team had a win percentage of 46.3%. Uh, didn't Wagner have to retire after his rookie year? No, he did not. <clears throat> no, he did not. So the, just a complete offshoot. And I just wanted to sort of look at what is ideal for a, uh, for a young player? Of course, none of this really factors in anything performance-based. Uh, minutes are not performance-based. You could be terrible and get a ton of minutes. Um, usage is not performance-based. You can be abysmal and apparently still get high usage. Thank you, Killian Hayes, Cade Cunningham, a lot of James Wiseman. A lot of players have high usage and are absolutely horrible at basketball. And, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with anything. And, you know, the team's overall success relative to you having that big a role so there's a sort of inverse relation here but if you're playing that big a part and you're really really terrible and your team is winning that doesn't make a lot of sense to me and i almost never found that to be the case anywhere there wasn't like this one you know um dewan wagner level you know type player who was playing major minutes uh for a 60 win team it just wasn't happening so yeah so anyways so that's just stretching my brain in in that direction now let's let's get on to the money ball element of this so daryl morey is a pioneer in so many ways of advanced stats and using that to sort of game the nba now if you are a raptor fan from 2006 2006 onward brian colangelo era you're going to realize that the raptors have been trying to manage one big problem which is how do we compete with New York, LA, Chicago? How do we compete with other market, you know, other markets that are large, but as a team that's in Canada, taxes, you know, cold weather, whatever, right? Whatever you want to say. It's not nearly as dire as, you know, oh my God, how do we compete as a San Antonio or an OKC Thunder, right? Toronto is a fantastic city, but there are still advantages and disadvantages and in any given year you might have like two three really major free agents if you're lucky and almost always there's a team that's in a slightly warmer bigger market that's got money to to bring them on or they stay or they stay put like Giannis so this really is one consistent question uh, one consistent point that keeps coming up among Raptor fans is well you know why you know what about like we can't afford to lose fred or pascal or we can't afford to lose this player or that player we can't get this guy that guy and i think this is a question that has been 16 17 years in the making now which is trying to figure out how do you work around that how do you fix it well how do you fix it number one you start a winning culture obviously uh number two you you start developing a strategy to override the system in a way that other people haven't thought of now the raptors like you find a unique market advantage now what do i mean by a market advantage are there any why is everyone commenting on the hair how how horrible was my hair before um thank you thank you for commenting on my hair <laughs> i just um I, I i'm assuming i look uh somewhat less disheveled so that's cool um okay so little bit of a detour sorry if i'm going if i'm jumping all over the place for people i was a very poor kid right we've established this several times i've i've cried my poor you know poor rob sob story <clears throat> but now i'm gonna come i'm gonna confess to some crimes some real legitimate crimes that i committed um against some unsuspecting civilians when i was um 12 13 years old and it was all about trying to find market efficiencies so yeah, maybe it's not the smartest thing to admit to crimes, but I was 13 and the statute of limitations tells me I can say whatever the hell I want, so I'm going to say it. All right, so when I was 12, I got a job. 
right? And I think I've mentioned this. I got a job $5 an hour and I was stocking milk and all that stuff, right? And I didn't like my boss. And my boss was a bit of a dick. And quite frankly, I just didn't like him, but I also was kind of too shy to quit or maybe I was too afraid to quit. felt like, And so one day I was on some allergy medication or something and I was just feeling very drowsy. And so he's stocking the he's stocking the paper towels on one side and I thought he told me to take them down. So I'm de-stacking them from the other side. Can you imagine stacking up all those paper towels for like f three, four minutes and then getting to the end and realizing the other guy was actually taking them down from the other side? Yo, he got so mad. Um, he actually raised his hand at me. And that was when I was like, no, sir. And that was when I created a plan that I was going to get this guy back. And to be honest, it turned into my first ever business. So here's what I would do. Okay. This is, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> uh, we had a lot of adult magazines in, in the store and this is pre, you know, I mean, this is not pre internet, obviously I mean, internet was around, but it was still in its infancy stages. And quite frankly, horny little kids, um, had a, a very difficult time accessing pornographic magazines. And so what I did was, um, since I was in charge of unstocking these things, what I would do is I would actually put them, I would always drop one into the recycling every single day that I would open up a Playboy or Hustler or whatever box, I would always, st I would always drop one into the recycling. Then after my shift, I would come back <coughs> and I would, um, pick it back up. So like a half an hour later, after I would take out the recycling, I would come, I would go, go across the street, grab some food and then come back and boom, I would grab it. And you're thinking, this is not a business strategy, Robert. This is just, you know, a 12 year old, uh, you know, um, satisfying their, you know, uh, curiosity, but no, actually I never opened them. <clears throat> I didn't need to. What I would do is I would find whoever had a birthday at my school and I would mark it up and I would sell it for as much as I could possibly get for it. So if the cover price was $13, these magazines were hella expensive back then, I would sell it for 50 bucks. And if the, you know, and eventually when he got into videotapes, oh, what was the market inefficiency there? Well, this was capitalizing on quite a few. Number one, my boss was a retard. Uh, whoops. Uh, my boss was, wow, I'm very sorry. My boss was absolutely, wow, I wanted to say it again. I, I really don't like this guy. My boss was very disorganized and he was not very smart. And he had basically gotten this business from his dad and he was just a dick of a boss, just a really bad person. And he just didn't, like honestly didn't care to to keep keep anything in terms of um yeah sorry i'm just trying to recalibrate there my bad i don't i don't want to say that word uh anyways so he didn't he didn't keep he didn't keep uh keep stocks so that was the first market inefficiency second market inefficiency the availability of the good that i was able to get so easily and the ability of people my age to acquire it so thank you, Canadian government, American government, um, you know, North American government in general for making that so, so difficult for children to acquire that. I mean, it's not like the same thing wouldn't work today, but obviously it worked back then. Thank you to the internet being in a kind of in an infancy stage, right? These things were hard to get. Market inefficiency number three, 12 year olds are kind of stupid. That's just a fact. I mean, geez you know, impulsive, stupid. And so sometimes they impulsive and stupid people come into $50 or $60 or whatever, um, because their birthday came up or whatever. So, you know, I'm a poor kid. These people are not poor. Their parents have money. Um, so why not? You know, that's, uh, that was me seeing a market inefficiency and capitalizing on it. I think the exact, this is, this is really funny. <laughs> okay. So Okay, the criminal activity did not stop there. So that was market inefficiency number one. Here's market inefficiency number two. Now, when I was uh, 13, 14, I was a bit of a kleptomaniac. And this is not something I've really, I, I don't like to admit this very often, but I'm oddly also very proud of it. And this is not me having Robin, Ho Robin Hood syndrome, because I eventually did um, get caught for this. But this was a strategy that I had um, when I was 14. So what I would do is I would walk into um, 
basically any store uh, that sold video games, expensive video games, like a Future Shop or Best Buy or whatever the hell was around back then. And I would come in with an X-Acto knife. And the the solution, and usually winters, you know, New York winters, Toronto winters, they're both like pretty heavy. So you could have big clothes on. I had a lot of big clothes. And so what I would do is I would have a two-stop thing after school, right? It's grade seven, grade eight. So Jason Williams, it did not stop there. No, it did not. It just continued, man. It just continued. <laughs> um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about the super serious stuff like that came a little bit more later but i mean i'm just gonna i'm gonna keep it pg here so i would walk into one of these stores and i would have like an exacto knife right in in my in my sleeve like this right and i was just walking around real casual trying to you know look look at a video game like oh you know this looks cool and i would swipe the side of it with the exacto knife so that so that the plastic would cut right I would go and I would mark like three video games like this, right? And this is when video games were in the jewel case, uh, those DVD containers. Yeah, you remember PS2 games, Xbox games, they were all in that same jewel case container. And this is before the the super security sticker. So I, I, I believe I deserve a little bit of credit for poking a hole in that market inefficiency of how poorly those, those things were packaged. So yeah, a $60, $70 game here. Yeah, I mean, honestly, man, like I, I'm not I'm not even trying to justify crime by, by saying I was poor, but I was really poor. And this is this is how I sort of found a solution around it. It's not it's not a good solution. I hope that no one ever does this, but this is what I did. And I'm just trying to tell you where my mind was going on this. OK, so I would go into these stores like a future shop or whatever. I would slash the side of it and then I would I would walk away. I might even walk out. I might go grab a meal, but I would remember the three that I slashed, you know, like I have pretty photographic memory. So I would remember like, okay, Gears of War, or whatever it was, Silent Hill 2, whatever, you know? And I would remember which one I which one I slashed. Then I would come back like 30 minutes later um, and I would flip my coat inside out. So I had like an orange coat that flipped into a blue coat. So I look like a completely different person now. So I walk in, completely different person, and I walk up and I pick up the same three games. And now here's the interesting part. I would press the game so that the disc would, you know, come loose. And then I would be looking at it, and when I would turn it over, I would actually like have a big sleeve, so it would just the game. I would pop it with my with my other finger, and it would just slap. It would just fall right through, and it would fall into my sleeve, and I'd walk out. Well, Rob, you're a genius. You you don't have uh you don't have the jewel. You don't have the cover. So what are you gonna do with this, right? You have you have the game. You have the disc. That's great. Then I would go to few, uh, then I would go to Blockbuster when Blockbuster was around, and I would just take the three. Um, they they didn't care. Like they didn't, they didn't check or anything. I would take the three jewel cases and then I go to HMV and make my first legal purchase of the day, which is jewel cases. And yeah, I mean, if in a successful week, I can do this like 10, 12, 15 times. Think about it. Do the math, do the math, do the math, little, little entrepreneur Rob, right? So you, you do the math, $60 a game, right? $60 a game, mark it up, sell it for 50 bucks used, right? 99 cents per jewel case. That's a, that's a $1 markdown on your, on your criminal activity. Everything else was free. I mean, technically it was stolen, but it was free. So it's a $49 like profit on every single video game. And I would just sell them on like Craigslist or Kijiji or whatever. And this was a, a little hustle that just kept going and going and going until I got caught in the stupidest thing. I guess what I'm trying to say is there were some market inefficiencies there, weren't there? Blockbuster didn't check that you were taking their covers because they didn't care because the covers were useless to anyone but me. HMV, Best Buy, Future Shop, video game, uh, you know, manufacturing companies were not expecting someone to walk in with an X-Acto knife, cut the side and just, and, you know, I probably never even thought about someone going home, not realizing the thing was, you know, and trying to come back to the store and being like, yo, my, my, uh, my video game was empty, but like, that's what it was like that's you know it, it happened and and honestly it was it was it was so sometimes the cut was so smooth that you would look at the thing and if you didn't shake it you didn't even know that the game was gone you might not even know the game was gone um this was capitalizing on a ton of market inefficiencies so what is a market inefficiency when it comes to basketball let's transition away from criminal past and and go to what is the market inefficiency when it comes to basketball well 
I think there's a human bias when it comes to players and how we look at players. And I think that this will pretty much show it. We look at things like past performance. Here, here are a series of things that I think drastically impact how you see a player. Appearance. Believe it or not, I think there's some very good science to say that if a person has a symmetrical face, you view them as more valuable. How can you distance that from how you view someone who plays basketball? I don't think you can. Um, your implicit biases, just your specific biases, that biases that are specific to you. So for instance, do I value a Nikola Jokic a little bit more than someone else because we share a heritage? Maybe, you know, do, does Charles Barkley look at, you know, um, a Phoenix Sun the same way he looks at a Denver Nugget? Uh, does, can Draymond Green be objective about a Michigan State alum? Can he? Does he look at Morris Peterson differently because he went to Michigan State? That's my point, right? Does Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, have a blue blood bias? I will guarantee you he does. He has, if it's not a blue blood bias, it is a college basketball bias. He has a massive bias towards players who play on dominant and relevant college teams. The irony of ironies, of course, was that they drafted Kwame Brown, but the story or the backstory behind that was they were actually trying to flip that guy, Kwame Brown, for a guy that Michael Jordan was very familiar with, who was from a blue blood school, which was Elton Brand, who played for the Chicago Bulls at the time. Unfortunately, um, they haggled too much on the deal, and the Bulls ended up flipping Elton Brand for Tyson Chandler. People often say that Michael Jordan picked Kwame Brown and how out of character that was. It's because he didn't want to pick Kwame Brown. He picked the guy who was supposed to be the number one pick, thinking that he could dangle him to the Bulls and get Elton Brand, and the Bulls ended up going with the Clippers offer for Tyson Chandler. That, I don't know how many people know that, but now you know that. Michael Kidd Gilchrist. Mason Plumley, Kemba Walker. What do these guys have in common? Um, Adam Morrison. You just think about just think about who he likes to play but like, like like who he likes to pick up who he likes to build his team around teams around brian colangelo a bit of a european bias in his selections but you know some people may not realize this but that's not actually a bias he thought he genuinely thought that was going to be a competitive advantage he thought let's just completely circumvent this whole idea or let's just bypass this whole idea of american athletes don't want to play in canada by not taking American athletes. Did that work? One thing that Brian talked about a lot, which I remember talking to him once about was size to skill ratio, he talked about it all the time. He wanted big playmakers. Was he onto something? Was Brian Colangelo way ahead of his time? Yes, he was. It's possible to be early. And he was very early. He to Turkoglu, Andrea Bargnani, Chris Bosch, three players who fit very much better in today's era than they did in 2008, 2009 with the Raptors, 100%, right? Um, Brian Colangelo wasn't wrong always. He was just early a lot. Even the irony, and this is so ironic, right? Colangelo makes a trade for Rudy Gay. Do you know that it was actually Rudy Gay, one of uh, a, a Team USA practice where Rudy Gay was present, where he stretched out his arms, that actually got Masai Ujiri really inspired and and and, and like kind of hyped up about this Vision Six Nine stuff. Yeah, so. What I'm trying to say is that we have to evolve our minds beyond points per game. We have to evolve our minds to think about this game in a deeper way that isn't just going to be looking at, well, my guy scores more points. My guy has an MVP. Your guys didn't. This guy's, you know, an ex-champion. This guy's not. These things are somewhat arbitrary and, and they're very useless. Fred Van Vliet is a ex-champion. Dame Lillard has never been to the NBA Finals. One of them impacts winning twice as much as the other. The championship ring is just a distraction. You know, Robert Hor Robert Ory has a championship ring. Darko Milicic has... A Robert Ory has six, seven championship rings? Hold on. Three with the Lakers, two with... Yeah, seven championship rings. Two with the Spurs, three with the Lakers, two with the Rockets, Right? I'm not mistaken, right? That's that's accurate. Seven championship rings. Is Robert Ori better than Rashid Wallace, who has one championship ring? I don't think so. No. 
So what does it mean? These are distractions, all MBA, all star. These are distractions. They distract. They, they are correlated sometimes, but there's not a causal relation between being great at basketball and winning MVPs. Sometimes you win an MVP and you're not even the best player on your team. It's happened before. And if you know the specific example I'm going to, I mean, you know, maybe uh, you can point it out, but it has happened before. There's a million reasons why, because there's a human bias. And when you're talking about human beings, there's always going to be bias, right? So how can we go past our biases? Well, numbers can help. But what happens when the people who are creating the numbers just want to create numbers that agree with their biases? That's when you get into trouble. So how do you how do you get past that? You just throw a whole bunch of numbers. No, I, th I think honestly, where analytics needs to go and where it has gone is really just letting the numbers lead you instead of you leading the numbers. So something like this, you know, what I was working on today with the development development score for, for young prospects, I didn't really have any vested interest in seeing Michael Jordan be number one on that list. And I have no vested interest in seeing Dewan Wagner be last. I, I genuinely just want to find something that works. And this is so far away from working right now, because I'm sure that I'm going to keep doing this for like 40 other prospects and I'm going to see like five or six examples where it's just like what the hell um, but I think it's a good start and I think we're in a good place in terms of analytics for the NBA I think it's getting there and it's not quite baseball and I don't think it ever will be because baseball is just such a, it's a much simpler sport specifically defensively I think half of we're, we're half blind when it comes to analytics because of defense it's so hard to say OG Ananobi is a way better defender than Pascal Siakam. It's it's hard. I mean, you can watch them and you can say it's obviously better, you know. But then this still doesn't get back to the main point, which is what is all of this anyway? Great defender, great shooter, great. It, the point is to win, right? We're trying to win. And the best teams out there are trying to figure out what is a player worth to me in terms of winning. Winning is not everything. Obviously, filling the stands is going to be somewhat of an importance to you. Dame Lillard, you know, let's say hypothetically, Dame Lillard at $40 million a year, right? Damian freaking Lillard, $40 million a year. Let's just say, let's say he produces 10 wins for you on that $40 million. Let's just say, hypothetically, he produces more, but let's just say that's $4 million a win, right? And let's say Fred Van Vliet signs a $40 million contract, which he won't, but let's say he does, and he produces 10 wins. That's also $4 million a win. So at the end of the day, are these equal? No, they're not. Because one of those players is insanely way more marketable. There has to be some part of it that has to be cut out for that. And I don't know how to gauge for a marketability score. So I'm not even going to bother with this. But what I am going to try to do right now is to attempt to, in a very basic way, give you the pathway to solving this massive question of where do wins come from by using win shares. Now, win shares pretty basic. Uh, Winchers per 48, pretty basic. Um, you can argue with the methodology, but I'm trying more for philosophy here. And here we go. So in terms of wins, right, like relatively speaking, you would look at the salaries of a Fred Van Vliet versus a Dame Lillard. And you might say, well, Fred makes 21.9. I think Dame makes 42.9. And their gap in win shares per 48 was pretty well established. It's almost twice in favor of Dame. But obviously, Fred makes way less money. So per this, Fred is actually a better value than Dame Lillard this year in terms of just how much he is worth per win, how much he's costing you per win. Now, there's obviously like a grander point to this, which I'll get to just as we close this out. But just take a look at this again. Now, you look at someone like a Scotty Barnes or a Tyrese Halliburton, two guys who are on their rookie contracts. Now, I've mentioned before how rare it is for rookies to impact winning or young players generally to impact winning. It's usually year three, year four, year five max when guys start to turn it around. You can literally look at the analytics of a lot of you know high-level lottery picks, even guys like Keegan Murray, um, Paolo Bancaro. They're barely impacting winning right now. Because, you know, young players just make so many mistakes. I mean, so many mistakes. They're late on coverages, late on rotations. They don't, they're just inexperienced. And those that inexperience is going to cost you in terms of wins. They might still score 25 points. You might still grab 12 rebounds. But they're costing you more than they will three, four years from now when they figure out those small things. But rookie scale contracts can be a massive, 
massive discount to get replacement level or above average players at very low below average cost. Now that's why lottery picks are worth so much. Now, you know, the I think the starting salary for a first or second overall pick might be in the 10, 11 ish million range, right? But what is the real value of a first overall pick? I guess it depends on who the first overall pick is, right? We've established that Victor Wembanyama, you know, the value on that pick could be 500 million plus, right? for a franchise, for a team, whatever. But in a year like where Anthony Bennett's going first, maybe it's like 13, 14 million. It scales, it varies. So what is the value of a win? Let's let's take a look at this really quickly. <clears throat> Tyrese Halliburton is, in my opinion, one of the three best value contracts in the NBA. Partially because he's still on his rookie scale contract where he's making just over $4 million a year because he was a late lottery pick. And you might look at a guy like Walker Kessler and say he's probably pushing it as well as one of the highest level um, contributors on a rookie scale contract because he's a late first rounder and he's massively impacting winning. Guys like this are, they are a scout's dream because they have upside, but they also impact winning right away. Um, Scotty Barnes, to his credit last year, uh, at a salary of just over $8 million, uh, contributed very well to winning at just under a million dollars win. But what's a good number here? What are what should you be aiming for when you sign a guy? So let's just say, for instance, you sign a Yaka Pertle or a Gary Trent Jr. Let's say you sign Gary to $20, $20 million next year. How many wins should you expect for your $20 million that you're signing him for, right? And of course, we can extrapolate this out to the concept beyond the year so you can say over, over the life of the contract how many wins is going to get me minus the injuries minus you know whatever like why does an auto porter who clearly you know could contribute upwards of eight wins nine wins on a year if he's healthy and plays a lot of minutes why is he signing for six seven million dollars well clearly because he's not a high minutes guy so he's gonna it's gonna impact it's gonna drastically reduce the amount of wins he's gonna produce for you and he's not and he's injury prone which we're seeing because he's only played eight games this year so Otto Porter cost you a ton of money this year. At $6 million for eight games played, his contract is actually an albatross. And that's crazy to say, because it was the biggest bargain contract ever. But obviously, guys like Lonzo Ball, um, Otto Porter, if they don't play for you, they're not contributing for you. Um, so let's look at this. So the average wins, naturally, 82-game season. One winner, one loser, every single game, 41 wins is the average, right? The average player salary in the NBA is $9.62 million. The average team salary, which was the median team salary, which I believe belongs to the Philadelphia 76ers, is $150 million. million so if we just use these numbers uh, to establish a baseline, right, when we say, average wins per average salary, then you should be expecting to get a value of 3.67 million per win. Okay. If you're going to sign a player. Um, and the good, uh, you know, so the, so the example of bad value, the bad value example is obviously Russell Westbrook, not to pick on Russell Westbrook. Notice I'm calling him Westbrook and not West Brick. Um, his, he's actually, this is crazy to say, he earns $27.97 million per one win he provides. Just to flash this back to, to what we were talking about with these guys, just look at these numbers. Fred Van Vliet, $2.44 million. Dame, $2.79 million. Russell Westbrook is at twenty-seven point nine, nearly $28 million a win. That's crazy. Obviously, the earlier mentioned Tyrese Halliburton. Obviously, you can plug in about 10 other players in this uh, for a very crazy comparison. And so you can make a conclusion based on this that Tyrese Halliburton, while he may not be a better, he might not be 88 times better than, uh, you know, Russell Westbrook. That's a crazy thing. But relative to as an asset, as a simply as an asset, he is 80 times, 88 times better than Russell Westbrook, which means what which means if it were feasible 88 russell westbrook's equal tyrese halliburton no of course not you can't do that because you cannot field 88 players at once if you could however then that would be a completely different story so i hope that this um and i'm gonna get to some comments here feel free to ask
sorry, I'm just gonna get um, Sorry, I'm just getting to the comments. Did I have a stall episode? <laughs> oh my god, that's funny. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, but that's hilarious. I actually... Um, so after I was 17 or so... And I, I don't mean to sound crazy, but like I, I felt much more religiously inclined uh, when I was 17, 18 and I started going to church and stuff. And ever since then, I have never I have never purchased anything bootleg. I don't stream shit illegally. My girlfriend hates that, but I won't do it. Plus, I'm a filmmaker, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to be streaming shit illegally. But yeah, I, I promised I reformed. I don't I don't do that shit anymore. Um, yes, he did. Uh, Sheridan Forbes says, Rob, you play to win at the end of the day. I get what you're saying, but sports have a short menu, wins and losses. No one remembers the appetizer of side meals. Winning is everything, or why do you play? Um, not really sure, uh, what you mean there. Um, obviously, uh, everything here is geared towards winning. <clears throat> uh, no, not, not really, because very seldom do rookies actually contribute to winning to give to give you a case in point and this is actually true kate cunningham had negative 0.5 win shares last year um so in order to determine the money per win um and you can go go about this many different ways i'm not trying to publish this as like a thesis for for but for how i did it i went uh win shares per 48 times 70 uh, 70 games uh times 70 so that was just the metric i used you can obviously you know feel free to um i mean that's 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 a massive over overestimate um of the number of a uh, number of games or whatever that that player would play i mean the, the only other way to extrapolate out a season that has currently been played is to have completely different numbers for the number of games played so for instance like i think fred van Vliet's played 56 games this year but i can't tell you how many of the next 10 games 12 games he's going to play so yeah um yeah and then naturally you just divide it by their salary and then you get how much money they're costing you per win oh no i did not know he was your idol but great idol um Um, yeah, so I mean, look, Nikola Jokic is a really big human being, uh, people, and here's, here's why I think defensive analytics get it wrong, is I don't think that they're necessarily great at mapping out how much a defense has to compensate for a bad defender. So for instance, if, if Fred Van Vliet does not have the defenders that he has around him, how good are his defensive, uh, how good is his defensive box plus minus, Right. And how much credit of a contest or a missed shot should go to Fred Van Vliet because he's the closest defender and how much of it should go to the threat of the illusion of OG and Anobi shading the corner. Like, you know what I mean? Like, defensive analytics are still in their infancy stage. This is like everything that they have right now, even like the good guys, like the guys who are trying their best. Um, I think there's some stuff. It's, it's, it's better than noise, like matchup difficulty and, you know... Um, just gauging uh the percentage at the rim i think rim defense is is kind of getting there you can look at percentages so for instance like we can we can for instance say like something very simple like the raptors have terrible paint defense i think that that is something you can say 
if this player is in this position on defense, this is the success rate of a shot attempt, you know, and then maybe draw your comparisons from there. But it's still noisy. These stats are still really noisy, right? Like, I, I honestly believe that Pascal Siakam, per my eye test, is like a 45th to 50th percentile defender. But stats keep telling me 65th. And I think Fred Van Vliet's worse too. So I want to sum this up. And I promise I'm going to close this out within the hour. I know that I've said this many times, but I do want to close this out in the hour. Um, so when I criticize um, a particular trade, specifically the Jacoperto trade, when I was critical of it, here's exactly what I was thinking, right? The timing of it, the, the wins cost of a player on the high end of a Scoot Henderson or a Victor Wembanyama. What you're costing yourself potentially by edging out from that player to what you'll get. The gap in those players and... Do you guys get what I'm saying here? The gap between the third player and the eighth player, ninth player, tenth player, twelfth player, whatever you get, right? That gap is the first gap. The second gap is two potential steals that you could have gotten, you know, 2023 draft pick, 2025 draft pick, second rounds. The third factor was what number of wins can Jakob give you in this shorter runway, right? I released a video today um, showing my original take on pretty much being the pioneer of the bring Jakob Pertle to Toronto movement in 2021. And people are still, you know, kind of like chirping and they're like oh no you hated the trade yeah th that was exactly this what i'm telling you like in this video what i'm trying to get at this value trying to understand where wins come from this stuff is exactly why i was high on Jakob Pertl and why i also did not want Jakob Pertl at this deadline there's a complete shift and we have to be able to be nuanced as a fan base to be able to say yeah, you can like a player a lot. You can think that they're going to fit and still think that enough time has collapsed. Um, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, maybe when I was, oh, thank you so much for the super chat sticker, Quota from Mars. And we have Coach Mo on the lines. So this will not be a one hour chat. This will go over one hour. I apologize. Um, what I'm trying to say here, when I was, when I first heard about the trade, I was very like triggered and maybe I didn't deal with it in in the best way. But I, I wanted to sort of, as I was making that video yesterday, I wanted to extrapolate my thoughts on this. It's a series of, it's an equation, really very simple. The Raptors have, and I'm trying to take you into the mind of someone who's Asperger's. So try to bear with me for a second here. The Raptors have, so the best way to understand this is through a series of statements followed by a conclusion. That's just how my brain works. I hope that that's, you know, easy to follow. Statement number one, and just tell me where I'm wrong, right? Statement number one, the Raptors season is very much about making it past the first round, that that would be the goal for this season. It's not to win a championship. It's not to be a championship contention team. That was never the bar. It is really to make it further than you made it last year. Um, and last year you lost in the first round in six games. You've brought back largely the same core. They're a year older. They're supposed to be better. And so the goal was second round or bust. Or heads are going to roll. Because they weren't happy with how they exited the playoff series last year. And so that was the thing. So earlier in the year, I thought if they get to third, they can beat the sixth team. And that way they will be able to make it to the second round and satisfy their, you know, desires for the season. The problem is by the time you made the Jacoperto trade, you actually have two additional variables to get added in. Number one, you're actually not going to be good enough to get to the fourth seed, which means you won't have home court advantage. Number two, the trade doesn't make you good enough to beat any of the teams for to have realistic to have realistic expectations to beat any of the teams in slots one, two, three, four. And that was my thinking that this trade happened too late and when i graded a d it's based on the timing and the best example that i can give to anyone who's still out there saying nah but you hated the trade is like this let's say you you know you you find someone on the street and they're dead and you're like hey 
do you need CPR, man? And then you start performing CPR on a corpse. You're late. You're late, okay? The CPR could have helped an hour ago, but it's too late now, okay? So that's how I felt about the season. It's how I continue to feel. I'm curious, optimistic, I don't know, cautiously optimistic to see like what is gonna happen, I guess. I mean, it's just kind of like watching a train wreck at some times, but we'll see, you know? Um, but that was my thinking. And I definitely think I'm right. I think I was right two years ago when I, or a year and three months ago when I said that they should trade for him. I 100% think he would have helped then. They didn't trade for him then. They wanted to keep their pick, fine. <laughs> But that pick that that trade then was what they turned down for the Spurs. <coughs> so if you want my honest opinion, that video was as much criticism of the Raptors front office for playing small initially and now doubling down on something too late. It's just timing. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. Um, Yeah, that's a really big part of it too. So so that was really big part of trying to understand asset management, right? So the earlier thing that I mentioned about depressed assets, whatever, right? Um, I'll give you another example of asset management. When So my ex-girlfriend was thinking about buying a property and there was a property at Jane and Eglinton. This was in 2014. 2014. And... We see this property and it's hella low, like hella low. It was like $160,000 for $160, no, $178,000 for a two-bedroom condo. And I was like, yo, you need to jump on this. So we played a game with the real estate agent where we basically scammed the real estate agent into being desperate. And we got a sense right away that this real estate agent was absolutely trash. So the, the reason that the property was being sold for less was because the condo board was being sued just a completely crazy lawsuit by someone who got stuck in an elevator and was suing the condo board for $5 million. And they didn't have the healthiest reserve fund. So there was a lot of panic of, as people tend to panic, oh my God, what what will happen if the condo board runs out of money and we're stuck holding this place? So some people panic sold. And so we called the real estate agent. I called as a separate person. She called as a separate person. She offered one amount. I offered another amount. They were both low right? Um, I offered 164, 164,000. I went, I saw the place, you know, just browsed around. I was like, Oh, it's great. And I made a conditional offer. They were not pleased. The people who owned the place were not pleased, but the real estate agent got them on board for 164. Okay. 164. That's a, that's a far cry from what they were asking for. And it was already depressed and it just asked for more. And then beyond that, um, after about three, four days, that conditional offer, it was about to expire. <clears throat> I, I pulled out and I had my ex-girlfriend call literally that same hour with a firm offer, not a conditional offer, a firm offer for 163. And this real estate agent was so terrified to tell the client that they had lost this low ball offer and they were probably afraid they were going to get fired. So they ended up convincing them to take less commission. So this real estate agent submit, uh, took their less commission and then agreed to that. So we got it for 163 and now the place is worth, I want to say 600,000, $700,000. Okay. So that is example of buying low on something and selling high if she sells, right? I think that that's a great example for how I feel about the Raptors right now, right? You didn't really buy low on Thaddeus Young, right? I don't think you bought low on Jakob Pertl. I think you bought late on Jakob Pertl, right? The other problem is there's always going to be, like when I, when, I, when I dug up that video from To The Point, one of the things that I said was if you trade for him and you end up trading picks, like future firsts, so I was thinking like 2022 out of the last year or the 2023 pick this year, and I was like, if you trade those picks and you have him, and this was, again, November 2021 when I said this, those picks won't be very good, which I believe would be true. He just, he he impacts winning in such a big way. He fills such a huge need. You're win, you, you know, you might not have a good pick. And therefore, the picks that you're surrendering up aren't good picks. The problem with the 2024 pick is you might not actually get him back. 
I mean, you think you get him back and maybe you will, but who knows? Someone comes in with a $30 million offer for Yago Pertle. Are you going to match it? You might not. You might not have the clearance to, you might not have the cap space to. I mean, you, you do have a certain amount of room under the cap space to go over, but to re-sign your own people and you retain his bird rights. But my God, like maybe you don't want to sign him to, you know, a hundred million over four years or I don't know, 120 over, uh, over four years or something crazy like that. And so that pick that you've given up to, you know, in 2024 could be worse. It could be worse than you're expecting and you didn't protect it. So this was exactly why I gave the, uh, gave the trade a D. Here are things that would have made the grade an A for me. I just want to quickly adjust on this. If the trade had been made at the start of the season, I, exact same trade, I would have given it an A. Um, if the pick protection on the 2024 pick uh, was lottery protected through at least two years and it converted into two seconds after three years, I would have given it at least a B because I still would have been pissed that we would have lost on this year's lottery pick. Um, if the trade had been made for a core piece, like a Pascal Siakam or a Fred Van Vliet, if, if one of those impact winning impact people were going out and a winning impact player was coming back, therefore it wouldn't really adjust how much you win this year. I would have also given it an A. No, you shipped out a complete net nothing in Ken Birch, right? And basically got back, right? Like you got back a really good player and that was sort of like the concoction of all those factors is why I gave it a D. So just to clarify the record forever, right? Yeah, and that's not shade on Jakob, right? I'm trying I'm trying to get people to understand that. You can love a player. Like I, I just I'm I'm starting to develop this reputation as a person who just doesn't like Jakob. Even my girlfriend thinks I don't like Jakob. She's like, but you gave the trade a D. And it's like, why is this so hard for people to understand? You can love a player, but hate the timing of the trade. Okay, let's uh, let's bring on Coach Mo. Coach Mo, what up, man? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I'm just enjoying the the talk, and it's interesting you're talking about uh, analytics and everything. And I was coaching Saturday, mm -hmm. and there's this one kid. He he has a friend, and he's like, oh, he's good at ball handling, and he's really skilled, and this and that. And I remember asking him. I asked him a simple question. I was like, does he help you win? Does he help us win? Mm -hmm. He he was speaking in glowing terms. And when I asked him that simple question, does he help us win? He paused. Because mm -hmm. even at that age, he understood, okay. It wasn't a definitive yes. He was like, eh, probably not. And that's on the terms I think of, right? I think, right. does this person help us win? Is this person a winning player? That's why I never thought highly of Wessel Westbrook. Never? I mean, early on I did. Well, especially early on, he had potential. He was still young, right? But You mean when he was winning only... MVPs? Huh? You mean when he was winning MVPs or before that? I mean, that one year he was actually pretty efficient. Yeah. Yeah, that one year. I mean, yeah, that you know, one year was crazy and he was clutch. But even when KD was there, there were things where you knew this guy's going to – he's – He's going to rear his ugly head. The, a Westbrook-type play is going to happen in a mm -hmm. big moment. And, you know, KD, you just see him almost like give up, right? Throw his hands up. I don't know. But I have a question. And it's sure. what attribute is more important, shooting or IQ? IQ. I agree. And I think the problem with this team is there are too many guys that can't shoot and don't have high IQ. There's just too many of them. But I think they can shoot. I think the fact is they don't have high IQ. Okay, so you think... Like uh, Malachi Flynn in an open gym, he can shoot. Um, if you look at Delano Banton this year, he's a much improved shooter. Chris Boucher, relative to Biggs, he can shoot. He's not great, but he can shoot. Precious to chew at 39% for the second half of last season. He can shoot. Scotty Barnes is in an open gym. He can shoot too. OG Ananobi, shooter. Mm -hmm. Gary Trent Jr., shooter. You know, Pascal Siakam said at 37% uh, percent entire year from three. Shoots 52% from the right corner. Yeah, but those, the 37% were, was a lot of corner shots and there were, a, he had no creation, like mm -hmm. real responsibility. So I think, and when you bring up the 37%, 
at this point, that's the outlier year. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But here's another question I have. If knowing the way things have been going the past couple of years, mm-hmm. if you're a rookie or an agent in this coming draft and you're going to be around 15th pick, do you want, knowing what you know, do you want to be a Raptor? If the status quo stays the same going into next season, do you want to be a Raptor? Probably not. No, I wouldn't. I'd steer my 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 uh, uh, player, if I'm an agent, I'm steering him off that team. If I see Fred and Pascal still on the team, and again, I don't like to be a guy who's hating, but I'm looking at Flynn, I'm looking at Banton, I'm looking at OG's frustration, and mm-hmm. I'm like, well, I'm not going to send him there. I'd rather him go to... I'd rather him go to Charlotte and at least, you know, develop somewhat or build some sort of confidence or, you know, advertise a skill set at least. Right. Right. But I don't know. I, I think like agents will will definitely steer their clients into places where they feel like they can get paid. Um, like a where lot they can of put guys up big are losing numbers. money on this team. A lot of guys are losing money on this team. Absolutely. Yeah. They are, um, but you know, one guy's making money. That's yeah. Oh, of course, of course. But again, that's what this team is designed for—to get a couple. And you said this. I was listening to your previous live stream. Mm-hmm. It's crazy when you talk about asset management. The guys who are on the books for next year are depreciating in value. The guys who Damn. aren't on the books are increasing. It's so. It's so backwards. Like it's so backwards here. It is a little bit crazy when you really think about it. Cause you're like, Oh my God, you know, like you could have realistically, you could, you could have like, I want to say, okay, you have Scotty. He's depreciating. Yes, he is. Right. I mean, relatively speaking as a trade asset, what you could have gotten, you could have gotten for him. Much now. You, yeah. Like whatever the equivalent of Kevin Durant is now if you wanted to and again having some sort of flexibility you don't you don't know what happens i mean what if you do win the lottery what if you end up drafting a victor Wembanyama? like now you know you're gonna play victor Wembanyama, and what you're gonna bring back yako Pertl too i'm just saying it's a great problem to have but it's it's like you want to have flexibility scotty offered you a lot of flexibility og offers you flexibility they offered you more flexibility last summer than this summer your asset heap has actually gotten worse Mm -hmm. um considerably Mm -hmm. not to mention the other thing that i didn't mention in the in the thing about the trades is you actually can't trade first round picks at all because of the protections on the 2024 pick you actually can't like you actually can't trade 2025 2026 2027 i believe you can't trade until 2028 or something so you're stuck you're stuck with this core until you convey that pick or you get it back somehow i don't know but it's it's kind of crazy to do that um obviously with the top six protection you're gonna give it up yeah right? gonna, that, that, that pick's gone so that pick might like i mean you might as well have not even protected it at that point like i mean i'm glad you got at least top six but i think there's something that i was thinking about a lot is why did they do top six protection i think it's because they are so so bearish on the 2024 draft class right early scouting is telling me the same thing that they didn't even want to risk getting the seventh pick next year. That's having to pay that player, even having that asset, because let's be honest, there are some years where the seventh pick holds a lot of value. Last year, the seventh pick held a lot of value. Uh, the year before the seventh pick held a lot of value. I mean, in most years, I think you can convince yourself that it's not a negative asset to have a seventh pick, but, they probably believe that in all likelihood they're going to convey at worst a very late lottery pick which they probably have no interest in or a mid first rounder which they believe is equal value for Jakob. so <clears throat> in my experience like from from just understanding how this team is processing i think that they are probably looking at this from the perspective of well if we didn't convey that pick now we have to convey it, convey it in a year where we actually do like the draft, like 2025, 2026. Okay. So they should right? have just put no protections on it in that case. But well, you know, I mean, like, I'm glad they didn't they didn't put no protections on it. Because God forbid, you know, you have the disaster season from hell. You end up getting the first yeah, pick and I then you convey it. it but was, but was... this might be rethinking why it was a top six protection as opposed to a lottery protection. Because, 
It's almost like, well, I mean, again, asset management, right? 2024 pick. Would you rather have the 12th pick in 2024, a draft class that you hate, that you've scouted, that you don't feel like there's even five players you want in that whole draft? Or do you want to give up the 18th pick in 2025? A lot of drafts, the 18th pick is actually much better than the 12th pick in yeah. the previous draft. So draft class scale, if let's say, for instance, year 2000, and this is why I think like, you know, going beyond um, just, oh, this guy's a first overall pick. Andre Bernard's a first overall pick. Cade's a first overall pick. So they have to be as good as LeBron or, you know, they have to be as good as Kyrie. Um, I think this has to be skewed down to percent, like, what if we could have an analytic that says overall draft strength, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say out of 100%, let's say 2003 is, or 1996 is as close to 100% as you get. And then you multiply that percentage by the pick. And that's what the actual, um, or sorry, you reverse, do you, do you get what I'm saying sort of? I do, so, yeah, that, so, be done, that can't be done till years down the line. But I mean, like at the time of the draft, I mean, for your internal calculus as a team, right? And you're planning it out. You have to be able to say, like, if you can scout ahead and say, man, 2025 looks amazing. Mm -hmm. We need, it's a deep class. Like last year, I was telling you all, like not you, but like specifically I was on, on lives and stuff saying, I'm not really hating this Thaddeus Young trade because I don't think there's a big gap between 20 and 30 in this draft. 20 and 35 it's a deep draft turns out it is a deep draft jalen williams late first round uh, early second rounder christian coloco early second rounder right yeah. you're looking at like there's at least it, like walker kessler late first rounder david roddy there's so many guys in that 20 to 35 range that could be clumped together andrew nembard right so there was talent there and and, and if you're a team that scouts early you can project that which means that if some team wants to, you know, trade you an asset and all they want is a second for a first, you know what I mean? You're moving down 13 spots. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. should know if that 13 spot difference is actually a big difference because there's a lot of drafts that are very flat in the middle too. So I think that we need to start assigning <clears throat> like a different like way of looking at picks so that we can intelligently talk about them. Because I don't think that it's fair to compare Chris, uh, say Chris Weber sucks because he's not Shaq. And Andreas sucks because he's not Chris Weber, and Cade sucks because he's not Andrea. <laughs> that's so bad to say, but it's true. Um, okay, that's that's crazy talk. But like, you get what I, you get what I'm saying. Like, there there's such a scaling difference. Like, even Scotty Barnes is a fourth overall pick. What does that even mean? You know, like, should I compare him to every fourth overall pick? Well, I can compare him to Chris Paul. He sucks. You know, I, but if I compare him to someone like um, shit, that guy Josh Jackson, he's the greatest player on earth. They're both for they're all fourth overall picks. <coughs> so um, yeah. yeah i something with analytics that i find interesting that's not quantifiable is the intangibles it's getting and close I, I think intangibles are so important like when i've watched people play mm -hmm. things i notice are like like what how do they handle adversity in a game when things aren't going well right okay they're not getting calls uh the other team's on a run yeah. Do they communicate? Are they talking? Do they mm -hmm. encourage people? Um, their toughness, right? Mm -hmm. Toughness is, is interesting. I was toughness to... is really important, man. It's because re when things get heightened, mm -hmm. when intensity gets heightened, when when people start taking the game personally, they take a matchup personally. They say, yeah. "No, I got him." You can even hear, it. "No, I'm guarding him," right? They start. Speaking a different way, man, things change. Things change quickly. Um, I agree with that. Toughness I, is a I, really I, huge thing, for sure. Like, yeah. you know, I was listening to a True Hoop podcast with David Thorpe, and he was talking about how toughness was a staple. In every single prospect evaluation he would do, he would say toughness was like a main thing that he would look at and say, does this player have it? And I was thinking about toughness. Like, what is it? Is it that what you're describing of, I got this guy? Is it offensive toughness, like the mm -hmm. ability to sort of take uh, take over a game or want to take over a game? Is it scoring aggression? And honestly, it started making me look a little bit differently at Scotty Barnes a little bit too, you know? Um, 
in terms of his offensive toughness in the fourth quarter. And maybe I'm starting to hear some of the stuff that people are saying, like, why can't he do that more? And it wouldn't make him a worse player to do more of it. Yeah, yeah. Like, the whole time I've been thinking, like, you know, he has to cater to his teammates, he has to cater to his teammates. Honestly, man, like, I'm at a point right now where I'm like, so much of where we are as a franchise right now comes down to all the players on this team, including Scotty. Right? Even though he's 21, even though we yeah. love him, you know, he needs to own up to some part of this too, right? So, Pascal, I think the rim defense. Rim defense and efficiency, right? Uh, one of the things that I was going to go into is that the Raptors are sort of gaming the system. I've talked about it in that Kawhi Leonard, you know, the Raptors are building for Kevin Durant. They're already building around Kevin Durant video. Um, but it talks about, like, how the Raptors are so great at certain things that are actually, like, really positive basketball things, like winning the steals differential every night, yeah, yeah. Um, crashing the glass, winning the possessions battle, etc., and the only gap really was this one thing, which was efficiency. It was yeah, just consistently shooting. shooting efficiency and paint defense were the two biggest gaps. So I think you address so much of that with Jakob Pertl, but is it a long-term solution or at some point does Jakob Pertl, like let's say for instance, now this is a crazy thought. What if you were to just flip a healthy Kevin Durant for a Pascal Siakam right now? The gap between those two players, does that catapult you into we're an NBA championship contender. I think it does. Yes, and that's exactly it. That's exactly it where we are right now as a franchise. You yeah, are Pascal Siakam or Scotty Barnes turning into either being traded for or converted into a superstar level player. Either one of those guys will do. Uh, so if Scotty takes that step, you're there. I think we're higher upside if you trade Pascal. Maybe not this season, but starting next year i think sure. it's crazy and and both of them have the skill set right now to easily move into second option territory right yeah, very I just, easily again i value i value iq and like being in the right place at the right time knowing when to cut because when right. you have a guy that good as kevin durant mm -hmm. you got to make his life as easy as possible but he makes your life easier yeah. too right like i mean you know so so much of when you're looking at you know one but of the things year, that probably I... pascal this year probably pascal right and I mean, like one of the things that I look at, you know, is the impact of a star on the other players. Like, how can you quantify, like, other than box plus minus EPM, like, how can you really quantify the psychological impact of playing with a star player yeah, in know, the crunch? Know. You know what I mean? Everybody or has even, yeah. Or even the gravity of a star. Like, how quantifiable is the fact that you have to guard Steph Curry 35 feet from the basket yeah. and you don't have to guard scotty barnes 20 it's feet like, from the basket like how 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 do we quantify that 15 foot differential it's like trying to get a number for when a kid gets beat up and then the the way he sticks his chest out when he brings his older brother to solve his problem that's that that's that it's like we have Kawhi, and we're coming with our chest sticked out that game seven against philly yeah we mm -hmm. all we all believe we could win that game we all believe we because we believed we had the best player in the arena and the and the Sixers players knew we had the best player in the arena, regardless of what they would Facts. say to the media. They knew we had the best player. Yeah, and I think that that's a really underrated part of this is like having the best player on the on the team, like on on you know on the opposing team. I guess like it, it's such a psychological edge that you have over your opponent on any night. You know what I mean? Like you you could easily uh, say that um, when the Raptors were like down and you're like on the you know what i mean like you, you could have folded mm -hmm. you could have folded in that series you could have uh, like easily you go to overtime you could lose like you could lose your composure you could get way too excited even like going into that milwaukee series like you go down oh two like i think that's sort of like an underrated thing it's like you know how if that's damar it doesn't even matter if damar like the psychology element yes. of it of we have Kawhi, we can come back from oh two right how do you quantify that into it, right? How do you quantify that sort of toughness that you're talking about? How do you quantify the intangible leadership of a uh, Kyle Lowry, the tough talk he's willing to have or how yeah. he is as a teammate? These things are, you know, still you ways that, away. Compare that and then compare that with, again, I don't mean to be mean, but compare that to the last game, the fourth mm -hmm. quarter against the Bucks, and your best player is like frustrated, complaining, getting blown by by Brooke Lopez. And that's what you see in Compare that to Kawhi Leonard and just him being stoic and 
right? Yeah. Nothing rattling him and like him challenging the coach. It's like, the, dude, it's night and day. It's night and day. It's like, and when people say, oh, Pascal's not him, dude, the players on our team know Pascal's not him. They know. They do. They know. They 100% so do. It's like, it's just the way they behave in the fourth quarter. It's, I don't know. But also another one of the intangibles you mentioned was marketability. And that's where I think DeMar has the advantage over Pascal. DeMar is just more marketable. He's just more, to me, he was just more likable. He was more charismatic. Like when he was in on the team, would mm-hmm. you argue basketball is bigger today than when DeMar was here in the city? Would you argue? No. You think basketball no. was bigger when DeMar was here? Yeah. The amount- no, not not in the city. I mean, like, Sorry, what, I've been in this city. I'm in this city. Like, like kids playing and all that yeah, stuff. Just, just uh, the love for the Raptors. No, I think people love the Raptors more when Demar was here. Then the amount of number tens you would see in this city was crazy. It was number ten. The amount number of seven, number forty threes all... I see is not nearly as much as number tens I see. Yo, bro, like I, uh, <laughs> I'm not even trying to throw shade on anybody, but I've never seen anyone wearing a 43 jersey until I went to a Raptors Dude, game. It is crazy, and I, 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 I don't want to be the guy that keeps hating on Pascal, but it's not the same. The love people had for Demar, and it's not like Demar took us to a championship. But people love that guy. I love Demar, even for his faults, even for his um, not his faults. He's just he just wasn't good enough to be the lead guy, but. Markability is a thing. At least the more you can be like, this dude sells tickets. I don't know anybody that says I'm going to the Raptors game to watch Pascal Siakam play. There are people, you know, he has fans. He, and of I mean, course so, he has so, fans. So, so fans. Uh, you know, Fred, I, actually Fred Fred, I actually see more Fred jerseys, to be honest with you. 23 is a better number. Yeah, it's a I, way I see more better Fred number. Jerseys, uh, in the city. I actually see more Fred jerseys. Yeah, 23 is a better number. Yeah, 23 is, um, is, a, is You know, and I, and I think also like, and again, you know, when I was talking about subconscious biases, People have subconscious biases. People want to be like people like Fred Van Vliet is an everyman. You know? He 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 looks like a Toronto man's. You know like what I mean? Drake. He I mean, I don't know if he looks like Drake, but he looks like a guy who's just from the block. He looks like those guys who show up to pick up, you know, in their in their in their Jordan ones. You know, like he just looks like a guy who you could be like, but you can't be. You know, I mean, like Fred Van Vliet's a thousand times better than, you know, the average basketball player. But I'm, but I'm saying, like, it kind of looks like the stuff that he does, dry heaving the basketball from 40 feet, is kind of shit that you've seen him pick up. And he doesn't have any physical advantages that make you think, like, oh, well, no wonder he can do that. He's seven feet tall. He's Nikola Jokic. Or, oh, no wonder he can do that. He's fucking jumping through the roof like Shaden Sharp. Like, he's just a normal dude. And that's actually the biggest appeal behind a guy like Steph Curry and guys like Michael Jordan. You remember the the ad? Um, I've missed this many shots. Yeah, 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 yeah. That entire ad campaign, genius. Maybe it was by my fault. Way. Maybe it was my fault. That commercial. That too. Yeah. Um, but the sp- the simple the the one I've missed this many shots. Yeah. I, I've 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 you know this many da, 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 da. that entire ad was basically to humanize a god. Yeah. People around the NBA used to call him Black Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Black Jesus. And it was apt. He would walk on water, man. You couldn't touch him. And Mm -hmm. he could do no wrong. And, you know, the NBA, uh, even all the rumors about the gambling just made him more human. It just made him more relatable. Everything, you know, him just being authentic, being himself, you know, um, even, even the... Uh, Republicans wear sneakers too. That comment, yeah, super relatable, right? And you might even think to yourself, like, my God, he's not—he's not even acting like he's above this shit. Like, you know, Charles Barkley is one of the most relatable human beings on the planet. And what is. part of him is relatable? He's six foot five. He's—he's he's also like a Greek god in terms of like physical ability. He was mm-hmm. like the most. He's LeBron James before LeBron James, and people don't really remember that. Or Zion before Zion. Like he was a physical freak, and. In all honesty, like one of the things that really humanized him for a lot of people was when he said, uh, I, when I signed my NBA paycheck, I, I, I called my mom and said, Mama, I'm a Republican now. I think that just combined, it, it, it kind yeah. of made him human. Like it's just a human being. And when, when he eats chicken wings and he puts on weight and he shows up out of shape, like that's just human. I think the more so, and that's probably why people hate LeBron so much, is because he's not human, he's perfect. 
I mean, people like he acts perfect. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you can't relate to LeBron. Nothing about his life feels re relatable. He's elite. He he runs businesses. He's like a social activist. He has like an amazing family. He's you know he's committed. He's uh, scandal free. He's yeah. You know what I mean? He's like he's not he's not even trying to pretend he's like you. He's not like you. And and I kind of appreciate that about him. But I think like that's the relatability factor. Anyways, I think the I guess the central point of of this chat was to examine our biases and to look past the numbers that we that agree with our minds and of try course. to expand ourselves beyond that and try to understand where where our own blind spots are, you know? I have a major blind spot for Scotty. Major blind spot. I was just what, like, my God, like I have to. Would you, have... would you have a blind spot for Scotty if he was 28 years old? No, no, I Thank wouldn't. Thank you. So is and, it really that big of a blind spot? Yes, it is. And it must be addressed. Look, we have an idea in our minds, right? That the future that we don't know is greater than the than the okay, present sure, that I we agree. do know, right? Yeah, yeah, you're, that you're, that sort of idea and and look i i know this implicitly because i i used to be at a hedge fund and you know not something i want to not that i'm really proud of this and my friends often you know said this was vaguely debatable in terms of ethics but there was a lot of pump and dump going on are you familiar with pump and dump yes i do i do okay cool okay so to those of you in the chat who are not familiar with pump and dump basically how it works is you aggressively stack um buy bids on a stock over a period of days and you artificially inflate the demand uh and value of the share price and then you create a mass panic as you trigger a whole bunch of stop losses by selling off a sizable portion of your shares and you end up like making a ton of money in the process because other people end up like having to sell for way 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 less than they would have liked to and then you short it on the other side and you make all your money back so large large thing for like when 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 you see there's something psychological about it i i woke up this morning netflix is down eight percent fucking hell what happened to netflix right you freak out you're like should i sell netflix what, what's gonna happen with my to my money and on on smaller stock exchanges and with smaller stocks and penny stocks this shit is like volatile as hell so there's a human component to this where it's like a human being is going to have a certain response emotionally to half their money getting wiped out in a day and if you don't have the stomach for that you shouldn't be in the stock game huh. but it's the same thing with with basketball man like people have bad seasons people like look look at the philadelphia 76ers markel Fultz, right great example of a kid that just needed a little bit more time and i think you know maybe you can argue he's never going to be living up to the first overall pick hype or whatever but he's been really good man the orlando magic bought low jeff weltman is a genius you know, and the Raptors should know that. Like he bought Loa Markel Fultz and they're thriving for it. Um, Franz Wagner, great example of, you know, uh, a very undervalued prospect in the draft, right? Relative to skill set, he was very undervalued. Like there are guys like this in every single year where it's... something about them, either their age, like Herbert Jones, yeah. or the way that they talk, like, in my opinion, a Scotty Barnes, right? I don't think he interviews super well. If you have a no, bias... No. I don't think he interviews super oh, well. He doesn't, he doesn't. And so he doesn't sell himself like Cade sells himself. He doesn't sell himself like Jalen Suggs sells himself. And you're lucky as a Toronto Raptor fan base that you have a GM who can see past that, who can see past the vernacular and the limited vocabulary or whatever. And, you know, like the way someone speaks and and you can actually just go past and how they sell themselves. You know, he's, Scotty's not a used car salesman. He's a vibes king. Like he's just a normal, authentic human being. If you value that in a human being, then you're going to love him. And if you don't value authenticity in a human being and you like more practiced career politicians, you're going to love Fred Van Vliet. It's just how it is. But I understand. I'm trying to understand the fan base that that is telling me, yo, Rob, you're seeing things in Scotty that aren't there. Yes, I am. Because I have a bias towards players who are unselfish. Huge bias towards players who are unselfish. I agree. Tim Duncan, Arvita Sabonis, like my, all my favorite players were super unselfish. I have a type. You know, like guys have a type when, when they like girls or like girls with big booties i like girls with blah, 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 blah. i like girls with blonde hair whatever yeah well we also have types with everything else we have a type of house we like we have a type of player that we like we we have like a, a type type of clothing that we like my type of player is unselfish that's it like and, that's that's all it is because, every yeah, go ahead. just because you got 10 assists doesn't mean you were unselfish facts 
There are a lot of players out I there. I believe selfish unselfish shots. means you could have got a good shot, but you gave someone else a better shot. Especially if that I think person, you just make the right play. Yes, but especially if the person couldn't. They're not high usage or they're not a primary option or they can't create offense for themselves consistently. That right. to me is like top of the – like what Jokic does for, you know, Bruce Brown or KCP, right, or Aaron Gordon. Those guys necessarily can't eat on their own consistently. Right. But, yeah, just because they finally double teamed me and then I threw a simple pass, it's like, okay, cool. Right. But Well, that's exactly like – I mean – my point is, it's not really judging anyone who has like a type like that's alpha scorers. You know, if you like guys who who just get buckets, right? And I think a lot of us do. I think a lot of us have a bias towards that type of player. And who the hell am I to say, well, I'm I'm smarter because I have a, you know? But basketball is a team sport. It, it is. has always been a team sport. And if you go through the history of basketball, when you find guys who are like bucket getters, when you say bucket getters, I'm talking MJ, Kobe. How did they win? How did they win? They won in a team structure. They won with the triangle, right? It's a complete system that is predicated on motion and, years and selflessness won, and movement, huh? The years they've won weren't their most, uh, their best statistical years in terms of numbers. Those weren't even their best years in terms of shiny stats. Hmm. But yeah, no, for sure. And right? and I think like you're not yeah. averaging career high points per game. And win a championship. That usually doesn't happen. It usually doesn't, but that's the thing. Like, like you get Larry Brown, right? He, he what, what did he do around Allen Iverson? Allen Iverson was a bucket getter, right? So what does he do? He puts a whole bunch of selfless, team first guys who do nothing but defend and pass the ball and play make and give the ball to Allen Iverson and say, okay, well, you want to run the fucking offense? You be the whole offense. That's what you're going to do anyway. You're the superstar. We we sell jerseys because of you. Kids come to the games because of you. Okay, this is a problem, but we're going to work around it. This is our solution. We're going to coach it this way. I think, that worked. I think that worked. For sure. They as, made oddly the finals. As, that, as oddly as that team was constructed, because I don't think Aaron McKee ever believed he was a 20-point per game scorer. I don't think Eric Snow believed he was a 20-point per game scorer. Bingo. I don't Everyone think was over, the, over themselves. Jumaine Theo Jones was, was over like, himself. I'm not dropping 20. Dikembe Mutombo was like, I'm not dropping 20. They traded Theo Rattler for Dikembe Mutombo. Oh, okay. But I mean, you know what I mean. Matt like, Geiger. Yeah. They that were whole... not going to drop 20. They struggled. That's an uphill battle for them. Facts. And and, and look, like none, none of this is... And you got to look at the Raptors OG right looks now. At, OG looks at Siakam and says, I can do what you're doing. He believes that. Aaron McKee didn't believe that. Yeah, there has, but but the gap between Aaron McKee and Allen Iverson exactly. is large enough that Aaron yes. McKee would be insane to think he could do that. Yes. The gap between OG, go. like, look to me. Here's the thing. Let me ask you a question. If you had to rate these following players in terms of their value, in terms of okay, like like that 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 graphic that I flashed right here, this right, this value statement, right. Who yeah. is the most valuable player? Can you rank the following four players in terms of value on wins? Okay. Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Bleet, OG Ananobi, and Jakob Pertl. So, I would put Yak number one. Mm -hmm. he, he provides the most value per wins. Then OG. Then Fred and Siakam's last. That's the crazy thing. That's actually pretty accurate. And I think that like, you could probably flip between Fred and OG. Um, you know, Yak, Fred, OG, Pascal. You could also go, you know, if you overvalue defense. I'm pretty sure Pascal's last on that on those four. I'm pretty sure too. And that's on the crazy part of it. It's like he's your franchise guy and yeah. he's last. Yeah. He's last in terms of impact. And there's a lot of analytics to prove it. You know, here's, and, here's and, my question with the Siakam. Here's the thing, here's my thing with Siakam. When he's having an off shooting night, how much is he really impacting winning? Is, on those on the games where he's shooting 35 percent from the field he's still a decent playmaker for his size he still runs in transition he's still a capable defender even though he doesn't defend as much as he should and he doesn't always pick the highest I and mean, he never guards the highest uh you know usage guys or or the toughest matchups he's his matchup difficulty is way easier than scotty's and ogs um i think on a night where he's not cooking like he's had you know in chess they they 
Do you, do you play chess on chess.com? No, no, never? No. Never? Okay. So on chess.com, you get a review. So you, they review your game and then they tell you like what type of player did you play like? Basically, like what level of player? Okay. Sometimes, you know, you'd be like a thousand, you, you'd be like a 1200 player and they'll tell you, you play like a 600 player today. And maybe you're really cooking and one day and they tell you, oh, you play like a 1380 player today. So it, it kind of gives you a game breakdown. So yeah, I think yeah. that's a that chess has come a further way than basketball because chess is an older game than basketball in terms of just the evolution of how we understand the theory and how much uh, algorithms have advanced in chess. So to put this into perspective, I think if uh, let's say a Michael Jordan game is let's use chess terms, a 2900 game, right? And you playing basketball, you or me playing basketball is like a 600 game. And then somewhere in the middle is Pascal Siakam, right? Well, relative to chess terms, Pascal Siakam is like a 2650, 2700 type of chess, uh, type of basketball player. And the gap is so enormous once you because because the thing is not like the gap between a 2700 and 2800 is way larger than an 800 and a 900. Yes, yeah, I agree. So it scales it scales on a curve like that. And so if but the the problem with basketball is it it works linearly. Everything in basketball works linearly. It doesn't work on that curve. So 30 point per game score is one like 5 points per game score that a better score than 25 mm -hmm. points per game. But it shouldn't be like that because scoring 30 points getting like from the, 25 to 30 is harder than getting from 5 to 10 bingo so that's the whole thing it has to it has to work exactly thank you um so so that's that's how it has to um that's how it has to be viewed and so when people say well you know the difference between pascal siakam and and jason tatum is like five points or whatever yeah those those five points and those 10 percent is like it's hard to say that it's just oh he's 10 15 percent better he's like three times better or something crazy like that and when you start talking about the best players in the league or he's two times better and we talk about the best players in the league they are actually like two times better than someone who's putting up similar stats yes, but I just agree. a little bit worse you know i watched i watched tatum against it was like you know those abc primetime games on saturday yeah I watched him. He couldn't make a shot to save his life against the Sixers, but at the very end, he made the game-winning shot. You can't, like, well, that's it's, it's just crazy, like how these guys, they just come up big, and nothing is going their way. Like he's missing everything, but he makes the game-winning shot. And my question is, if they're close, when was the last time Pascal came up big in a fourth quarter, or will this team to a victory, or just dragged us to the finish line, like these guys do all the time? I've mm. seen like you've seen these top guys drag their teams kicking and screaming to the finish line for a game, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, like, look, John Morant, you know, final four seconds uh, in the game. How do you measure the offensive opportunity he's going to generate? Yes. See, I think like that's the thing. Like, you know, I want to stop thinking about makes and misses. I want to start thinking about offensive opportunities and quality of shots, right? And a quality of a shot is really the the basis of most of my low light films uh you know criticizing the offense is that this offense will sometimes generate great opportunities for a roller to the rim that's a that's a two that should be like 1.8 points 1.7 points a, a dunk for christian coloco should be automatic right so when you miss that what are you doing you're costing yourself you know something and then when you replace that with not an open corner three, yeah. but something stupid like a fade away over two people, you actually like, if you start doing the, like a rank score, like I would love to do this one day where I take, um, you know, like uh, there are like certain games where like you do a certain action and you get like a flash that says negative 200 respect, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. or like yeah, yeah. plus plus 200 respect, like something GTA, like that. Like GTA. Yeah, like GTA. So I would love to do that for like a Fred Van Vliet and just consider it a game score and, and say, OK, well, if he has the ball and he misses a wide open Chris Boucher under the basket, then that should count as like a negative 1.6 or whatever Chris Boucher shoots on that. And then go forward from there and, and, and actually try to create a game score for him. And therefore, the more he handles the ball, the more likely he is to not only generate positive opportunities with the ball, 
but also miss positive opportunities yes, with the yes. ball. This would be, in my opinion, the way to take basketball analytics forward because passing, that's the, the that's the part that's the missing. The passing, right? passing. Exactly. So let's say Scott. Let's just say like in a, in a complete simulation, we have a Scotty Barnes possession and a Fred VanVleet possession, right? So Fred VanVleet dribbles the ball, dribble, 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 and then he you know goes to the he goes in for a layup, right? Okay. Well, I don't want to actually credit him for two points if he makes it and i don't want to credit him for zero if he uh misses it what i want to do is based on the shot that he took i want to give him what he usually generates on that shot as an average okay okay so let's say he averages and i'm not saying this is true but let's just say he averages 0.8 points per layup attempt and let's say it jumps down to 0. 0.75 when it's contested or 0. 0.6 when it's contested well, when he attempts a layup against one defender at the rim, I want that to be 0. 0.6 points registered for him. But then if he missed a wide open Scotty Barnes in transition streaking to the basket, I want that score because he was handling the ball and he should have seen it to be negative two. So now negative two plus 0. 0.6 equals a score of negative zero, negative 1.4 on that possession. Now, let's say he also missed a wide open Gary Trent Jr. Uh, mm -hmm. in the corner and there was not a defender within him and any reasonable passer would have made that pass. Well, now I need him to own up to that, too, because the fact that you were holding the ball instead of passing the ball yeah. should count against you. Too many stats actually value the fact they, they take for granted that just because you hold the ball, you should be holding the ball. So usage, passer rating, play uh, load. All of these analytics, they all favor guys who hold the ball more and, yes. and they take. And so guys like Draymond Green, Nikola Jokic, DeMontis Sabonis, Jakob Pertl, Scotty Barnes, guys who actually have very short possessions with the ball don't actually get the proper credit that they deserve yeah. for being so quick with the ball. And the quicker you move the ball, the more of an advantage you're generating for your teammate. Then... On top of that, take this one step further and say, just the very act of passing to Gary Trent Jr. is not enough. I need to see how well Gary Trent Jr. shoots on your passes Pass versus, exactly. And then I need to see how well he shoots on a pass from Scotty Barnes, a pass from OG Ananobi, a pass from Chris Boucher. And now the offense that forces a Fred to Gary corner pass has to now suffer the consequences of not being an offense that did not create a Scotty. I, I take to... it a step further. I take it a step further. Do you remember that play in the Bucks game in the fourth quarter, where which one? Siakam passed it to Perto, but it was like at his knees. Yes. And he threw. And he. And this is one thing that frustrates me when I'm coaching the kids is, when somebody's in close proximity to you, you don't have to whip it at them. Right. Like yeah. use the correct, depending on what it's. It's hard to gauge it sometimes, but he whipped it at his knees, and it was a turnover. Right. And I don't know. And he fumbled the pass. And Yak is right. such a great guy. I read his lips. He's like, uh, during a stoppage of play, he was like, my bad. I should have caught that. And it's like, no, it's not your bad. It's he not is your a great bad. guy. He is such He's a, a great guy. Wonderful human being, that guy. But Siakam threw a horrible pass on what would have been a layup. But it's like, I also think with your the way you're thinking, you need to deduct points for not, if it's Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Fleet, uh, mm -hmm. Scotty Barnes. If they're ahead of you and you can throw an outlet pass and you not doing the go-ahead pass to mm -hmm. like half court, you should be deducted points. I agree. And, and and you know what? You, you know what this would create? This would create a game where Fred Van Bleed has like instead of being credited for like 25 points, seven assists, he'd be credited with a game score of like negative 38 or negative 500 or something crazy like that. And you would be like, oh, and, and and then you could actually measure the difference between running your offense through a guy who makes good yeah. reads and good passes all the time, like a Tyrese Halliburton, versus because I don't think that EPM and box plus minus are even coming close to measuring the gap between these two players. I realize the gap is like three times. I think it should be more than three times because what they're doing for their teammates, like I'm sorry, like Buddy Heald is not shooting as well. Um, if he's getting those passes from Fred Van Vliet versus Tyrese. Like Tyrese is just no such a great no passer. No he's, he has yeah. eyes behind the back of his head. And so he's going to find you early. He's going to find you on target. He's going to put it right in your hand. And if you're a shooter, you know that that makes such a difference. Also, the predictability of knowing where the pass is coming and that you're going to get the pass actually motivates you to cut and actually respace into corners. 
If I know that I'm playing with a guy who's never going to find me, I'm not that motivated to run in transition. What, mm -hmm. where's, the, where's the analytic to show me how motivated my teammates are to run in transition because I'm not a selfish ball hog? That's that's an analytic that's missing from basketball. So when, you know, Kevin O'Connor and guys like this say like, oh, we're really close offensively, like with the analytics stuff, we're not. There's so much more to this. When you talk about the intangibles, the toughness, all that stuff. Yeah, that, that you know, it might sound like woo way to some people, but I think that this would, this opportunity cost element is such a glaring weakness and missingness. Like if you make, if you grab a rebound, you get credit. If you miss a rebound, if you don't block out yeah. and you miss a rebound, that should cost you something. Now, yeah, it technically costs you by osmosis almost because your true rebound, you know, total rebounding percentage goes down. But I think like there needs to be more of a penalty for the things you don't do correctly as opposed to an over over reliance on things you do correctly because i think maybe like po stats lean more positive than negative like for instance like you know we have a stat for steals turnovers. steals turnovers. per game <clears throat> yeah include yeah for, for for turnovers for sure is a negative stat per se but like okay and also missed shots are a negative <laughs> stat and those are the two negative stats in a box score but like for instance like there's no stat for what happens when you go for a gamble on a passing lane and you just don't like you don't get it and then your defense has to recover or there's no stat for pascal siakam falling out of bounds and forcing his teammates or like chris boucher or gary chantry or any one of these guys who you know do these circus layups at the rim and you know don't make the basket or even if they do make the basket you know this is the only team which actually gives up transition on a made basket all the time like fucking all the time like they, they'll, they'll they'll make a shot whether they make or miss whether it's fred or they I don't see another team do this as often as the Raptors do, but they yeah. do it so often. I don't know and why the teams don't find guys for like flopping. Gary does this thing where he does it like once a week where he shoots, does the splits, falls on the floor. No one hit him, but he tried to sell the call and he's on the floor looking at the referee and then the other team's on the other side. It's like, dude, cut that out. If they yeah. follow you, make the – if they follow you, they follow you. And if the refs call it, they call it. But all yeah. this falling down – like it's just too much. It it's puts so much quiet. pressure on your defense to get back. It, 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 does, it yeah. puts your it puts your teammates in foul trouble. So let's say, for instance, you know Pascal, like the 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 sort of string, the the basketball events uh, happen on a string, right? So let's say Pascal Siakam decides to fall down, um, because he's trying to sell the contact. It's let's strange. say he's slow to get up, right? Let's say that results in Jakob Pertl picking up a fourth foul, okay? So now we have Jakob Pertl having to play the rest of the game a little bit more cautiously. What mm -hmm. is the impact of making Jakob Pertl your best defender or your second best defender 10% less forceful and less impactful on defense for the rest of the game because you didn't get back in transition or because you decided to take a stupid shot? The connected nature of basketball, like the offense and defense, we often look at offense one way, defense one way. You know, I'm just saying that there's so much... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that's missing here in terms of what we're talking about and what we should be talking about i'm not even talking pascal top five top 10 top 20. let's fucking retire that debate like let's not never talk about I that agree. again and i i was i'm talking like is he a top three player in terms of impact on his own team Amen, like, brother. like like when you start looking at the right stuff Amen. You're not talking. You're not talking super max, max, uh, all this stuff. Oh. You're talking like, is he worth twenty five million dollars next year based on what he provides? And it's like obvious answer is no shit, buddy. He scores twenty four points, but when you're By when way, you're scoring, the, game keeps going down, huh? Watch it dip to twenty three. It just keeps going down, dude. I I talked to a very smart analytics per, uh, analytics person yesterday, and he said. Every single person that you're hyped about right now scoring 32, 33 points per game, the number of players over 30 points per game, Jason Tatum's over 30, uh, Joel Embiid, I think, is over 30. There's so many guys yeah. who are scoring over 30 points per game, right? This SG, was not the case. Yeah, all Andy these guys. Mitchell. They're saying that we need to adjust scoring down by about four points per game for inflation, okay? So if you adjust his 24 points per game down for scoring inflation, that's 20 points per game. He's a 20-point-per-game scorer, bro. Yeah. This is this is like Sharif Abdurrahim territory in terms of you know first option scoring. He's just a little bit more efficient. I think it's just is insane 
that we just keep talking about this guy like he's he's so great he's not and, he's and he's just not and he's not okay. doing all the other shit to make up for the fact that he's not great at his job and it's like that's that's the thing like you know the other day i was listening to a youtuber I'm not going to name you know he was saying scotty's not a point guard okay so if scotty is not a point guard like one one i think is a misnomer because i don't think that we are even in an age where we should be talking about positions anymore i look at the oklahoma city thunder and the way they play basketball and I swear to God, on one play, Jalen Williams is a point guard, J-Dub. And on the next play, Josh Giddey is the point guard. And the next play, Shea Gilders Alexander is the point guard. I mean, trust me, at some point, Chet Holmgren is going to be the point guard. Lou Dort is bringing the ball up to court. Somehow. Lou Dort bringing the ball. Like, this is the this is the future of basketball, okay. man. Okay. And OKC yeah. is so on the cusp of it. But, There's like, there are others. There's John Stockton ever again. It's over. I don't want to say ever again because we have Fred Van Vliet, you know, and, that, and that's literally his life goal. Well, but... I mean, in terms of having that style of basketball lead you to back-to-back -back final uh, it's not and, and i mean not. like the, the the you know you look at the golden state warriors and they get a lot of credit for this and people always talk about the shooting and they talk about draymond they talk about steph's shooting steph's gravity draymond look at how unpredictable that fucking offense is it can be initiated from just about anywhere it can it can hurt you from just about anywhere they have guys who finish at the rim really well they have guys who protect the paint their defense is elite Steph's a way better defender than people give him credit for, especially now. And I mean, like, you have Draymond Green, uh, who unlocks all this gravity of all these shooters around him. The whole thing is, like, you're playing, like, I mean, 25 feet, right? Let's say, let's let's assume that a court is 30 feet wide. How how, how, how wide is an enemy court? It's not, it's not 30 feet for 30. It's like 45 feet wide, right? Like 45, 50 feet? I don't I'm know. I'm not exactly sure, but... Wait, if the distance from the basket, I mean, this is pretty simple to figure out. If the distance from the basket from a corner three is about 23.5 feet, then the basket 23.5 is, let's say it's 48 feet, right? Let's wait. That, it's let's 94 say 40... feet by 50 feet. Okay, that makes sense. So 50 feet. So it's 40, It's so the three-point line is 46-ish, okay? 46.5 on both sides, and then you add the padding the, they need to widen the courts anyways 50 feet okay so let's say the golden state warriors have 50 feet um of width they can score from anywhere there and let's say you said 94 feet right so that means mm -hmm. the half court is um wow okay you said you said 96 feet 94 94 okay so i say the golden state warriors based on steph's gravity have that entire like space from half court all Basically. the way to the baseline, the baseline. And that's pretty much what they're playing with. And that's how wide they can spread you apart. And that's how, that's how their spacing works. And that's, and that's an advantage. I think we need a metric to, me to measure the gravity of a player. Um, I think that's, that's another way the basketball can go, which is the bop it thing that I was talking about. And, and the chess stuff is how much does the gap between clay and steph versus the gap between and i don't mean the gap as in talent gap or anything i'm talking of the physical gap between where they operate on the court and where they still have gravity between those two guys and uh, jordan pool or something like that versus fred and gary and how much does their motion and movement in terms of where they know and how they know and how they cut yeah. like like one of the things i was noticing was um Dame Lillard, Steph Curry are great first options, but they're also elite second options. Yes. If ever put into a position where they are not primary ball handlers, they're incredible moving off the ball. Portability. It is portability, which is why Steph Curry can so easily adjust to playing next to a guy like uh, someone like uh, yeah. Kevin Durant, right? It's so easy. And, and that's why he can also adjust to an off ball role when, you know, in those, you know, massive Clay Thompson games. He still has gravity because he still moves. He still knows where to cut. He knows how to back cut. He knows how to help his teammates. That's, that's, I think, yeah. the major thing missing from Siakam's game because it doesn't come all the time. And now it's sort of missing from Fred's game too because like he does it and he can do it. I think if if I was to like say like the one thing that I would want, that I think could change this entire team, Fred and Pascal being willing to help their teams help their team when they don't have the ball in their hands more fred oh. does it more like he does fred it does it more yes fred does it more yeah but if pascal lot, continuously if pascal could run in transition even if he doesn't have the ball 
Right now, he's just too invested in, I, I got to have the ball to run. So if he can run in transition when he doesn't have the ball, if he can, you know, be be a guy who can cut behind the defense, kind of like what Jakob Pertl does, if he can add gravity in that way by consistently moving the pieces around, then I think that that's going to unlock Scotty's passing even more. And what I think he'll actually you know score is, more. What you're asking is basically him switching his mindset from uh, lead actor to supporting actor. I don't think so. No, I, it, like from play to play, which is normally what every player does. Because when you don't have the ball, you're kind of a supporting cast member. I mean, and, look, Steph Curry yeah. knows he's the man in of Golden course, State. But that's, he's not that's thinking like, oh, like is Andrew guys. Wiggins the man? And, but Jason Tatum knows he's the man. Jason Tatum still moves a lot of basketball, you know? Like, oh, Nikola Jokic knows he's the man. Nikola Jokic still averages 14 attempts per game, and he still moves the basketball, too. He still flashes into points. Jakob Pertl and Scotty Barnes and, to some extent, OG Ananobi are not doing something, like, transformative. They're not they're breaking not. the internet not. or anything. But they're just asking. playing actual basketball. Yes. This is basketball. Flashing oh. to, like, passing and then, and then cutting to an open space is basketball. Relocating to give the offensive player a better angle is basketball. What these guys are doing, and, and here's the thing. You said that they need to shift their mindset from, uh, you know, changing, changing their mindset from supporting to leading. I don't think that's even necessary. What I think they need to do is change their priorities from numbers to winning. Because that's one thing that, you know, I was listening to True Who podcast and it was like David Thorpe was talking about how he works with NBA players. And he said that one of the things he's noticed is that most really great players, they don't talk about numbers. They, they think about wins. When, when they're looking at, like, he's like, when I listen to a college player address their game, they don't usually start with, well, I had 32 and four assists. They don't, they don't talk like that. That's how Fred Van Vliet talks, man. I'm just being straight up. That's always how he talks. Even though he tells you something about the numbers, he, that's how he's always talked. But he, but what, what good players and what, like not good players, but winners, what they often do is team rebounds. We rebounded the ball well tonight. We pressured the ball well. We moved it. Scotty doesn't say, I pass the ball from side to side. He says, we move the ball from side to side. The we concept can never be lost in basketball, ever. It has to always be firmly at the at the forefront of everything you're doing because the defense will always give you one time every two weeks. They're going to give you a game where OG needs 22 shots and you can't make up in your mind before you go into the game, that he's getting 10 shots that game because that's 12 well, opportunities you Brent, cost that yourself. That first half against the Wolves, that first half against the Wolves, you can bet your every money in your account that Fred premeditated that first half. He because did. It, he it did. Just, and it was, it was so, so frustrating. Blatant. It was so blatant. That first half was premeditated. Absolutely. And what I don't respect about it is it's against a Wolf team that at their best, fully healthy, are mediocre, and they were missing their two best players. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I, can't, I can't respect it. And and that's where and that's where I say like we need to start shifting our attention away from makes and misses and just over prioritizing and starting to say like well Fred Van Vliet's the greatest player in the world because he scored thirty two points and he's the worst player in the world because he scored five points I think that misses the point and it misses the forest and the trees I didn't shit on him when he had his zero for eleven game or whatever you know I didn't because he took good shots but I did shit on him when he had thirty two points because he took all bad shots you know so like people don't get that but my 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 thought process is always going to be process based right. Like I'm always going to be more invested in how you got the answer than whether you, whether or not you got it right or wrong, because that's actually going to help me understand more about you, where you are mentally and spiritually with the game of basketball. So like for Scotty, it's like it's not so much for me that he is shooting 30 percent from three. It's more so that he's taking the threes that he's supposed to take yeah. and he's learning which threes he's supposed to take, which ones he's not supposed to take. This is a very essential part of it. For, uh, for Siakam, he had he had a game, I think two games ago or last game, where he was one for six from three. I like loved the shots, it. I loved like the it. Shots. Exactly. Loved yeah, the, like shots. the shots. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, Siakam went one for six from three. That's disingenuous and completely stupid. No, yes. he took the right shots. He will eventually make them. You have to trust that. Hesitation. Exactly. So that's where shot quality as a metric comes in as that needs to be the goal of any offense. The goal of an offense is not actually to make shots. 
The goal of an offense is to generate, generate three goals. to four quality options on any given possession within the first 20 seconds of the shot clock, which means that if that is your goal, and if your goal is not, well, I, I need this possession to generate three points for my scoring scoring totals, but rather I need to generate four good options for my team, then what you do is you play different. You see that Scotty has a clearer angle to make a pass to Jakob. You don't think, let me dribble it closer to Jakob and make the pass myself so I can get the assist. Okay. You pass to you pass to Scotty and then you trust him to make the pass to Jakob. Where this falls apart is when one person, and I do mean it could just literally be any one person, decides he's not going to do it. That he's not going to play this way. And now nobody plays this way. In fact, I have so much respect for Jakob Pertl and Scotty Barnes and OG Ananobi for continuing to try to play the right way when so many people around them are not playing the right way mm -hmm. because it's hard to do. Because you watch, take one second and watch the Houston Rockets or the, <clears throat> the Detroit Pistons and it's so nauseating, so frustrating to watch these teams that, play. Do you think there's a correlation between playing the right way and high IQ? I think Fred VanVleet has really high IQ. I, I do think. too. But I think well, he's I, really I don't selfish. Know. I don't know. Like, okay, so if you think he has really high IQ, you think he's he's missing open Bro, guys he on purpose? he studies the game. He studies the game. He knows the game. So you think he's game. doing it on purpose? No, I think he's... You know, <clears throat> let's put it this way. Okay. Easy dump passes, and then he takes a contested layup over two guys. You think that's on purpose? Why would he not take the assist okay. to help his stats? I, I get what you're saying. So let's let's put it this way. Uh, sentential logic says we lay out a set of premises to arrive at a conclusion, right? Premise number one. Let's say let's say like I go to the basketball court. Let's say like I'm gonna go and oh my god. Let's say I'm going for Geely tryout again. <laughs> I've been rejected twice, but let, let me let's say I'm gonna go again. Okay. Premise number one. I am a great passer. Premise number two. I am five foot eleven. Premise number three, I'm a great shooter. Premise number four, my defender can't guard me. If any of those premises are incorrect, my conclusion will almost always falter. So if I'm not a great shooter, but I think I'm a great shooter, then I'm going to take shots that are not going to go in as much as I would think that they should. And I'm going to keep doing it until I either come to a realization that I'm not a great shooter or work so hard that my delusion turns into reality, right? Same thing with Fred Van Vliet. He says, he actually has said this, and this is not me making this up. He has said that he doesn't realize how short he is, that sometimes he walks around and he thinks he's really tall until he stands next to someone like Pascal. And then he realizes, oh my God, like, you know, these guys are so much taller than me. But he's like, uh, you know, and, and Masai Ujiri has joked about it. He's like, he's six foot nine in his mind, right? That's the problem. Every single shot he's ever taken would be perfectly almost almost every single shot he was ever taken would be perfectly justifiable if he was actually six foot six six foot seven six foot eight as an undersized guard he has not actually accepted his undersizedness because i think psychologically it would just be very difficult for him to swallow that pill mm -hmm. and so his refusal to swallow his pill that he's not a generational passer that he's not you know going to be a first option in the nba and his success rate so far conning people into believing that he is capable of that because he made an all-star team he sh had hot shooting months or whatever finals mvp vote finals mvp vote you know won the starting job you know beat out delon wright who was probably a better player at the time for the backup spot like there's so many things he's done that this process of betting on yourself i mean he wasn't better than delon wright when he showed up but he thought he was better than kyle lowry when he showed up that Aggressive overestimation of your skills is what betting on yourself is all about. Bet on yourself enough. You crap out. Always. It just happens that way. So his equation is fine. Like he's, His basketball intelligence is fine. The only part of his equation that's flawed is him. He oh, does not know who he is. If Scotty Barnes walks out tomorrow and he says, I am Steph Curry as a shooter. I'm Steph Curry. You know what crazy ass shots he's going to take if he if he starts thinking that? Like, you know how fucked up, like, you'd be pulling up from the logo and you'd be looking around like, is Scotty, did Scotty Barnes just pull up with the from the fucking logo? What is he doing? Is it a bad shot? 
Not if you actually think you're Steph Curry, then it's a great shot. The IQ component is not flawed. The self-awareness component is flawed. Okay. And with when, when your thoughts on Pascal, it's the IQ part. Yes. With Pascal, it's the IQ, for sure. There's so many times where he does not know. It, I don't think he's doing it blatantly. He's not doing it on purpose. I, I That's the thing. I don't think he's that cunning. He's not like Fred. In terms yeah. of the master manipulator, I don't think that's Pascal. I don't think so either. I think he's just, I think they're both bl very so un unaware of themselves. I think to some extent, I think Pascal, you know, from what I've heard from him is at least trying to dig into self-awareness. They, they, these two friends, like their friendship is so common in the world. Like he, almost everyone knows two people like this that are, that are best friends. <laughs> so many best friends followed this exact personality type model of, you know, leader, follower, you know, manipulator, manipulated, whatever. Right. And, and you, you almost feel like if, if you lose Fred and Pascal is just without him, he just gets better. Probably, probably falls right back into line as a guy. And that's what he is right now. He's a guy. He's a, he's a guy who's been elevated to the position of the guy. And I think he would be so much better as a guy. And, and maybe he'd be better being paid off, pay, paid as a guy. And even though, you know, you have a franchise that needs to market a superstar, well, you know, maybe you just market yourself as a team that doesn't have one now, you know, and maybe they can just lean into that. And I, I'm sure that if they make it to the play-in or the playoffs, I'm sure Pascal is not so egotistical that he would just jack up 28 shots or whatever. I hope that he's learned from the bubble that if he doesn't have it, don't, don't do that. But yeah, I think I think we're at a point now where I've seen him defer to Scotty, defer yeah. to OG in in the fourth quarter when he doesn't have it going. Do you remember you know? when? Do you remember when Casey would bench Demar? In like there were like two fourth quarters. I think one was against the Indiana Pacers in the first round, and there mm -hmm. was one against the Cavs in the second round in like twenty eighteen or whatever. Do you think? Do you think it's justified, or you've ever thought Pascal should have been benched in a fourth quarter? Tons of times. And Casey never did it in the regular season, but it's almost like I found it kind of ironic that mm -hmm. Casey, when his job was on the line, yeah, and he was feeling the heat, would be like, okay, I got to bench tomorrow. And it's crazy. It's like that's actually what you think of him on the court in these moments. And I remember it doesn't that. help you to win. Now you're going to do it if your job's on the line. But you know what I mean? It's crazy. Like now you're telling us how you really feel, Casey. Right. But I, I get that. And, and at the same time, I also empathize with doing Casey. I, I don't like doing Casey. I'm not a fan of doing Casey at all. No one has ever confused me for being a Dwayne Casey fan. But one thing I will agree is that you can't coach. Um, you can't coach pros like you coach amateurs. No, you cannot. You know, and so if you're going to bench your star <laughs> player and then that star player is going to get dogged on Twitter and in the press, whatever, you better have a damn good reason for it. Because Basically, it's you just, better win. Basically, you better it's, win. It's unfortunate, but it's the world we live in. I, I would love to live in a world where, you know, a Scotty Barnes or a Pascal Siakam or an OG Ananobi can easily be benched for whatever reason, and no one cares. And it's just trusted that the coach knew what they were doing. And I would love to live in a world where that coach has to defend that decision and without without the toxic scrutiny that comes with it, right? Just say, hey... Why did you decide to go with, you know, Precious Achua over, you know, Pascal Siakam? Uh, he's 5% stronger. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. That's all that was required, you know, and, and it doesn't need to go there. But where we are, you know, as a society right now is we're going to make it toxic. We're going to say, oh, nurse makes a statement about Pascal and he benches him. Nurse on the hot seat. This is what, no, you know what I mean? Only challenge, or like what, Pascal needs to show up in the fourth quarter. He'll and never so say like, that. He'll never say that. He'll challenge, he'll challenge Barnes in the media. He'll challenge Gary, Gary Trent. No, I'm not saying media. he would he'll say that. I'm saying that's yeah, what the coverage. Jua. He'll challenge Precious Jew in the media. Sure. Like, Basically, yeah. He plays just, favorites, this is, which is why I don't respect any of that. Yeah, but, but also like that's also, those are the guys that you can coach. See, that's also a part of it. I think that we that, we that sometimes miss. To me. That sounds disgusting to me. Some guys don't don't respond well to being coached that way, though. Phil Jackson used to coach through through the media a lot. Um, he would coach Kobe Bryant through the media, and Kobe was cool with it. the The best thing that a player can do, like, yo, honestly, one of the things that uh, really got me 
very inspired about Scotty is that he's insanely coachable. He wants to know what he did wrong. He wants to know how to get it better all the time. He's always looking to be coached. He's always looking for new ideas on how to expand his game. He's never closed minded. He doesn't come into the gym and saying, well, I know everything and you know nothing, you know, and that, and that sort of attitude is just, it's terrible for growth, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but some people just don't, they don't like being called out in the media. They, they don't respond well to it. It's not even like they don't respond well to it, yeah, right? How, how did Pascal respond to being benched? They had to fucking fine him for contract detrimental to the team. The Masai Ujiri had to have an intervention with him. All that intervention shit about, oh, Masai had a tough talk with Scotty this year. I mean, shit, man. He had plenty of tough talks with Pascal Siakam a couple of years ago. So my point is, like, you you got to you gotta look at it from... Look, if I if you have somebody where... I always said, like, there's, there's people that if you yell at them, they shut down. Uh, yeah. And it's just not effective to yell at them. Well, what are you going to get by shut... You, you shut, I'm, you I'm shut down. Saying, I'm not saying... Uh, go through to the media like you do with Gary, but I just feel like when it comes to Pascal and Fred, there's zero accountability. From our vantage point as fans, I just feel like there's zero accountability. Zero. Like, hmm. well, that's the, but that's what these numbers are for, right? I mean, the numbers will tell you the truth. I mean, even when, like, if if you can get it to. Like, that's the thing. Value of a replacement is not paying, playing favorites. Uh, EPM is not playing favorites. PER, high, highly flawed, is not playing favorites. True shooting percentage is not playing favorites. These things are balancing out what we think, like, our numbers. Like, like so one subconscious bias we all have is a higher number is always going to be perceived as better than a lower number, right? So, one way, like, are you a fan of Jimmy Highroller? Jimmy, oh, the, the YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know some of the stuff. Have you have you seen some of the graphs that he makes? Not really. Like he's he's really famous for this. So so in his content, there's always like some sort of graph, and and the graph is trying to show you like how great this thing is or how crazy this thing is. And these graphs are always like an oh fuck moment for the for the audience when they're watching. And by the way, shout out to Jimmy High Roller if anyone it, by yeah. any million of a chance he ends up watching my small ass you know, self, like I'm a huge fan and this is not criticism. This is actually uh, admiration of mastery. So he'll like, so let's just say we're talking like box plus minus on the season and he'll like create this plotted graph and everything will be like clustered together. And then he'll be like, he'll scroll way up and he'll be like, and here's Anthony Davis, but wait. And then here's Nicole Jokic. And, and, and really like that's just showing yeah. the perceptive gap between them but it's stretched because because he knows that psychologically when you see you have to rise that far up to get to Nikola Jokic on that graph you're going to think that Nikola Jokic is 100 times better and he's not but it, that's just the way the graph is was written out so yeah. obviously if Fred Van Vliet looks down at the box score and all he sees is points rebounds assists and he's going to think he had a great game every fucking day change the way we measure the game you change the game but who's paying people to the archaic points rebounds assists who's who's doing that fans like, does that work fans who refuse no, to fans, adapt. Fans, fans aren't cutting these guys checks well look gms are not thinking in terms of this Thank, exactly. G gms are not like if gms were thinking in terms of this right then scotty barnes would not have been the rookie hottest the commodity uh he wouldn't have been rookie of the year Jalen Green or Kate Cunningham would have won Rookie of the Year over so him because he scored is, more why points. Is, why does Fred, if he has this mindset, why does he have that? He's mind? old school, man. He's super old school. Like like Fred Van Vliet. Like there, do, have you ever? Have you ever? Uh, you think when, 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 when you when you go Orlando to a Raptors game? This? Pardon? You think the Orlando GM is loving this? Maybe it's changing his mind. He's like, oh, more money. Throw five million extra on what we we're going to offer. I just Yo, like, you know what I, mean? I I honestly prefer uh, Markel Fultz. So I don't know what the fuck I they're doing. Suggs. Yeah, Suggs is turning into a injury prone Alex Caruso clone, which is a very interesting player type you know to why? put next I to a I prefer like these guys when you talk about like um microwave scores, like like let's say Jordan Poole. Mm -hmm. I value someone like Alex Caruso over Jordan Poole because I know Alex Caruso is gonna give it to me on defense every he's gonna give bring the defense every night. He's gonna bring the hustle every night. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Jordan Poole is going to shoot well every night. I don't know that. I think it's. I think they're both incomplete. Um, I know. I know they're both incomplete. 
but one guy started for the Lakers on the final game of the championship against the Heat. That's how valuable he is. But see, this is ironically, and I'm not going to call you out on this, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. That statement right there shows you the biases that we have. Alex dude, Caruso is great. He played like 40 minutes that game. It was like, dude, he was how, like there. How old is Alex there. Caruso? I know. I get it. No, I get it. Right. Well, obviously, so we pay him more than, than you, Jordan you, Poole. You, you, you talking, you talking Alex Caruso over Jordan Poole, which I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I actually like Alex Caruso a lot more than most. Uh, probably most of his family Alex, members like him. Okay, I love Jordan him. Poole on a, <clears throat> I don't know, like how much is he helping? Like Jordan Poole is shooting pretty bad this year. It's not good. Sure, and and and, and the good. and and you might look at someone like a Jordan Poole uh, or any role player in the NBA and say, you know, they are very very highly sensitive to the team around them and the offense around them, and if the team is going to suck, they're going to suck. Yes, they're they're I not agree. people who they're not going to pe- they're not they're not needle movers. You know, we talk about no, like not. guys and like uh, yeah. Bradley Beal, right? Bradley Beal is not a needle mover. He can't no, he, he can't carry an offense for you. Uh, he has a reputation as a great shooter. He's, He's not a great shooter, and. And so someone like that paying him 46, 47 million, this is what I'm talking about. From a team building perspective, if your 47 million gets you 10 wins and somebody else's 47 million gets you tw- gets them 20 wins, this is the this is all building up to that whole, you know, Pascal Siakam max that people like love to yeah. talk about, right? Him at 42 million giving you six wins or seven wins on a year is so oh. disastrous. Because that means that in order for the rest of your roster to even be a 500 team, right? Like, let's say, for instance, he makes 50 million. Just in a whack ass, you know, like world. Which let's is, say he makes 50 which million. It could be true. If he makes all NBA, yes, it could be true. Let's say he makes 50 million and he gives you 10 wins. Let's just say, for instance, fuck 10 wins. Let's say he gives you eight wins. No, 10 wins. Let's give him nah, eight. Eight. I can't put him at 10. So give him eight. So he gives you eight wins. Okay. Well, eight minus 40, 41. So now you have 33 wins, 30, 34 wins, 33 wins, 33 wins that you have to uh, make up for with, and if league average salary is uh, 150 million, you have $100 million now to make up 33 wins. All because you decided to get eight wins from from the first 50 million. And to be honest, the crazy part about this is stars are supposed to be underpaid not overpaid where you lose money on your roster in my opinion in terms of win shares is usually at the bottom half of your roster not at the top um bottom half and middle middle top so like in my opinion your your star player like lebron in his prime massively underpaid yeah probably relative to the max contract or whatever Nikola Jokic right now relative to what he produces massively underpaid he is well below that number that I I flashed. So I flashed a number here. Uh, no, that was not it. This. So if the average, like if we look at the baseline value of 3.67 per win, so $3.67 million per win, then that means in order to compensate for Pascal Siakam only giving you eight wins, let's just say your target is 48 wins, which is reasonable expectable that means the rest of your roster provided that you're gonna um it has to be basically 2.5 so if baseline value is 3.67 you need to get every other player at 2.5 million per win average to make up for one bad contract yeah that's the crazy part that i'm trying to hammer home here and he's one bad contract can kill you and he's not even he's not the thing with him too is even if you pay him like a number a lot of number twos are paid like number ones mm-hmm. he depending on the number one you get if you get him doesn't necessarily mean he'll fit right he's not like he's not like a Lillard or Curry you can easily slide into that number two and just fit yeah. right so it's like you gotta hope the number one that comes in fits with him too it's just all, too many things have to go right too many things have to go right for it to work and I don't think it will I think so too, but I think one way that it can work, uh, temporarily at least, is value, massive value coming in from somewhere else, right? So if we're going to assume that Pascal Siakam is going to be overpaid next year relative to value, uh, relative to that baseline value that I said of 3.67, let's just say even if he ends up at 
and four. He's probably never going to be at two. Because in order to be at two, as a 45 to 50 million player, you have to be the best player, like one of the best players in the league. And he's mm-hmm. not going to be that, right, mm-hmm. in terms of impact. So at that point, you have to find value somewhere else. I look at guys like Malachi Flynn, Delano Banton, Jeff Doughton. If one of these guys, not Will Barton, too old. If one of these other three guys, if one of these guys could be signed up and you identify the right one, right and you can sign them to like a three year six and a half seven million dollar type of deal right that's the type of contract you need because that one player for that six seven million dollars uh might generate you like 15 wins and that could be the steal contract and i'm saying 15 wins across the three years not in one year um someone like that and then obviously your rookie next year, if you draft well, if you draft a guy, especially like you draft an upperclassman, you draft like a senior who's maybe a little bit more ready, like the Kings did with, uh, not that Keegan Murray was a senior, but like he's an older player. Herb Jones, another example of mm-hmm. fantastic value that the Pelicans are draft, uh, you know, drafting. They're, I mean, Herb Jones, relative to his salary, he's making, I think he's making a million-ish, a million and, a million and change every year. He's giving you so much value. Mm-hmm. he's giving you value that's on par with several players in this league who are making $25 million, $22 million gap between him and, you know, someone like Gary Trent, you know what I mean? Like Gary Trent makes 18, $19 million. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, it's so like that value. value has to come back. And now you only compound the issue. Cause if you sign Pascal to the big deal, and if you don't, if you overpay the other guys too, well now you're, you have like the smallest window to become a 48 win team, which is basically Scotty on a rookie contract morphing into the type of player who can give you 15 to 16 wins yep and that would be the only way to compensate from the lack of impact coming from those other guys because obviously if you want to trade those assets at some point like let's say you do sign gary trent to 25 million a year and it's too rich but you do it because you didn't want to lose him for nothing well now you have to trade him for somebody and everyone else knows you overpaid and they overpaid and you're gonna have to get off assets so it's kind of a uh, interesting way of looking at it, but I, I would like fan bases to so- stop thinking in terms of points per game and this guy's an all-star, this guy started in the finals, no offense, you know, things like that, and move more towards impact metrics and trying to understand value from that perspective because I do think that there are underrated players in this in the NBA for a plethora of reasons. You know, either they are have a reputation as being character guys or bad character guys, or maybe they're perceived to be unathletic. I think Luka Doncic is a market inefficiency, you know, in terms of how we yeah. measure, immeasure, the, like the, the lack of proper understanding of athleticism, balance, coordination, strength. These things should matter. It's not all shade and sharp. Shade and sharp is not a better athlete than Luka Doncic necessarily. It depends on how you quantify athleticism. If you only going to measure, you know what I mean? Like if you want to measure only bench press as the way that an athlete is measured, well, Kevin Durant at the draft combine is the worst athlete in NBA history. Couldn't bench press 185 once, right? But like you got to measure it different ways. And it's like our, our evaluations of this game can only be good as the tools that we're using to measure them and the theories and thought processes that are leading us to those false conclusions. And so I'm just asking us as a fan base before we jump into this guy's a hater, that guy's a hater, this guy's a Scotty Dick yeah. Rider, this guy's yeah. a Pascal Stan, this guy's a Fred Van Vliet nut hugger. Before we jump into those and can we evolve beyond that to just be like critical of things in a fair way, I think that, that would be a good place to end this, I think. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting for this summer what happens. Um, talking about all this in value and man this yeah. summer I, I think they put themselves in such a tough position this summer to negotiate their assets because so like siakam went down oh gee i think he went down uh fred probably went up yak went up gary flatlined i guess but it's like i think it's, it's gonna be interesting it's gonna be interesting I just think it's I think it's paramount we give Scotty on his rookie deal mm-hmm. a true opportunity to see what he's made of. Like we really need 
to see what he's made of. And I don't know if you caught the part where I was uh, talking about this, like this development analytic that I was trying to work on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm really starting to feel that it is important uh, to be a winning team, but also to get reps and that there's somehow some sort of juggling that has to go on between those two things. Because I've seen too many Houston Rocket games this season. I've seen five, six, and that's five too many. Honestly, that team is abysmal. It's just, I've mentioned it before. I love so many players on that team. Someone mentioned Dacian Nix in the comments. Love Dacian Nix. Love, you know, um, Jabari Smith. Love Alperin I feel bad for I feel bad for Jabari Smith because I was listening to, I don't know who, who, who was talking about them, but it's like, Jabari Smith plays the right way, and it's like if he misses his first two shots, his teammates, yeah, his teammates, it's just, yeah. And you watch it, and it's like I feel bad for this guy, but you do, and, of- and he's slowly starting to figure it out. Like, and and honestly, if it was me, like, and, and again, like that's Cade and Jalen Green are such an example of the imperfect equation that we're talking about here, because they they're bucket getters, but they're super inefficient playmakers. They're turnover prone. Um, they're highly overrated on defense. I think K is obviously better, but like we see what we want to see. Six foot six is mentally ingrained in our brains as prototypical Jordan clone esque. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's something about it. Six foot six wing. They're both smooth talkers. They both have like a game that's really pretty to watch. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? They feel like stars, but they don't have an impact like stars. No. Neither one of them holds a candle to fucking uh, Josh Giddy right now. Neither one of them is holding a candle to Scotty Barnes. Neither one of them is holding a candle to Franz Wagner. In terms of helping your team win basketball games. In terms of helping your team generate offensive possessions that are conducive to making points. Like, in a very simple way. Like, not to sound like an android, <laughs> but it's true. And in terms of two-way impact, like, the talent element of this and the read and react element of this and the, and the mental processing of this the injury proneness the the impact on winning all of it is so decidedly in favor of those yeah. three guys yeah. that you almost have to wonder how the hell those two went one and two and guys like evan mobley went three scotty went four giddy went six right and and franz wagner went all the way to eight that draft class is sneaky starting to remind me of 1996 in some if ways you think about it orlando could have secured their entire future if they would have got the if they could redo it their whole future is set They're josh bugged. giddy no the magic had two picks if they just yeah. if, if it they was pick josh giddy and uh franz wagner they would yeah, be set they'd, they'd be done they'd be finished it'd be a wrap wow that's worth noting i mean geez can you imagine if we had gone Suggs, because they were going to go Barnes. Oh, Lord. But I don't know if they would have had the courage to go with Franz think, as a second think, pick. Do you think but... Suggs would have struggled as much as he did in Orlando and Toronto? Um, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, maybe not as much, because he would have carved out a defensive role and stuff. But I, I, I saw the struggles, for sure. I Two months before the draft, he was fourth on my big board fourth so my big board was Cade first Evan second Scotty third Suggs fourth Jalen Green fifth I was very down on Jalen Green um three days before the draft I had Suggs all the way down to like ninth do you think I had soured on him so much I had listened to like so many pre-draft interviews with him and I was just I was done you think um a lot of scouts and teams are learning from the Jalen Green pick what are they learning? To not value scoring as and like how tall is Green? Like six three? Uh he's technically six four and a half. Uh, but some people he, think he, he's closer to six five. Really? Yeah. I just you know what I mean? Like not picking biggest guy. Obviously we're going away from just picking l- lumbering centers. Like that's not a thing anymore. Like in hindsight, why would you pick DeAndre Ayton first over Luca. Yeah. Again, the improper measurement. Because you see, like, again, there is an there is a subconscious notion due to years of watching Tim Duncan, Shaquille O'Neal, um, Pascal Siak, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, yeah, Hakeem Olajuwon, Kareem, Kareem Wilt, 
that David size Robinson. and basketball is is correlated that that being bigger it makes you better at basketball and, and it's true it actually is true so it's not even like it's kooky science is 100 percent true being bigger is better like i mean there's a reason why victor Wimbanyama is so hyped to hell but he's a versatile big big exactly big difference versatile because now defenses and offenses must adjust for how size is now a hindrance it's like the art of war right the art of war suggests that if your enemy is big then you are small being small has advantages if you only hone in on well they're bigger than me yeah but you're smaller than them I mean, this is how i approach you know tackling the media yeah they're bigger than me they're more connected than me they have like resources me there's more of them than there are of me but i'm small i can say what i want and I'm not beholden to anybody. I don't have to like, you know, sit here and, you know, be super, super, I don't want to say nice. Like, I don't have a, I don't have a relationship to nurture with Fred Van Vliet. I don't have to meet him in the tunnel. So I can say certain things that maybe, yep. you know, someone like Blake Murphy or Sam Bassini or these guys can't because they definitely know him and, and they've met him and they know people who know him. And saying something about him could put put them into controversy and then could put their publication into controversy so being sort of putting it in that perspective like the art of war suggests that if a defender is big then you can attack them with speed and shooting and space yep. and to be honest you take the three-point shooting you take the three-point line out of the game you go right back to lumbering centers 100 mm -hmm. percent the only way this shit works is that one line. That one line literally is allowing Steph Curry to be who he is and has DeMarcus Cousins out of the league. You take that one line out of the game, DeMarcus Cousins is a better player than Steph Curry. That one line changes everything. And that sounds crazy. That sounds fucking insane. But it's true. And there's a reason why Brutes have dominated in the paint forever. And there's a reason why Patrick Ewing might go undrafted today. I mean, he wouldn't go undrafted, but like, I mean, he he might be like not a first pick today, and he was like the most hyped prospect ever. I know. Um, at the time, because having a guy who could score from the most efficient place in basketball is always, always going to be in high demand for a first overall pick. Well, Victor Wembanyama can also score from the most efficient places in basketball, which is the three point line and at the rim. So that's kind of like where um where it comes in i think i just think guys the reason why i like scotty barnes a lot is mm -hmm. the guys who have been the recent like best players uh, besides um steph curry who's an anomaly but it was like yeah. lebron kd Kawhi, Giannis, right that archetype of player where they're like between like six eight and six ten ish Mm -hmm. And they're mobile, like predator uh, scoring wings or, or or big playmakers. I think that's just like, it's like the holy grail of basketball right Absolutely. now. You, you take a look at a guy like a Kawhi Leonard or a Paul George. And I think Paul George is an even better example, even though Kawhi Leonard is like the more hyped version of it, right? What can Paul George not do exactly. on the basketball court? He can literally do everything. He's about six foot eight and a half. He can handle the basketball. He can be a primary initiator, a secondary initiator. He can be a connector on offense. He can be a shooter. He can be a spacer. He can be a slasher. He can guard Multiple the other team's teams. version of him, which yeah. is to say if he wasn't Kawhi Leonard's teammate, he'd be, he would be, he'd, he'd be guarding Kawhi Leonard. Paul George is like... Ew, when be, Jimmy Butler is insane. And Jimmy Butler, Paul George, to me, are like the most one of two of the most underrated players in the last 12 years of basketball and Pascal Siakam is on the complete flip side of it, which is, I think he's overrated. So he's making all Here, NBA teams. These guys are making all thing. NBA teams. Here's one another of these, thing. Yeah. You could have three Paul Georges on the same team and have them play at the same time and it would work. Yes, it, it would could work and it would work really well. You can't have two Pascals. You can't even have two Pascals on the same team. Hmm. It'd be tough. Three, you'd you it'd, it'd go downhill and it would crash and burn. That's what I mean, like the portability part, right? Yeah. No, I agree. And I love this comment by Daryl here. He said, "New title for this video: Demarcus Cousins is better than Steph Curry with one simple change." <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And, and I mean, it's 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 so true though. 
like you you take a guy like and, and i mean like this is uh so someone asked when uh when did the three-point line come in it's 1979 1980 season when the nba added the three-point line and guys weren't taking them because no, guys weren't were. practicing um so you very coaches rarely were, the coaches didn't want you taking coaches them. hated it coaches coaches were very slow to adapt and and you know what this is when when people still talk in terms of point guard shooting guard small forward other than to to paint a picture of you know scotty's a point guard as opposed to saying scotty's a primary initiator because no one will understand what the fuck you're talking about or very few people will understand what you're talking about so when i say point guard i don't mean he has to you know necessarily start at point guard i'm just saying that his primary responsibility should be more in line with nikola Jokic than aaron gordon you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of where you want your most gifted passers to be. You want them to have the ball because that thing that I described yeah. earlier of the plus two, minus two, plus two, minus two is always going to be better when you have a plus def uh, plus playmaker handling the ball more often than not, which is what the Raptors absolutely refuse to do. We refuse to play toward strengths. strengths. Exactly. Don't even do that. Gary Trent Jr.'s greatest strength, in my opinion, is isolation scoring yes. with the basketball. Fred Van Bleet's greatest strength, in my opinion, is moving without the basketball and shooting threes spot off shooting. motion, yeah. spot up shooting. Pascal Siakam's greatest strength is running in transition and Scoring basically against mismatches, one on one against mis mismatches, uh, mismatch hunting, uh, rim running, um, pick and roll partner for a gifted passer, etc. You know, cutting behind the defense, like Aaron Gordon ish lo mm -hmm. level stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not an isolation scorer. OG Ananobi probably shooting shooting corner threes standstill corner threes spot up shooting right scotty barnes playmaking so and it's like Believe everyone on. is doing the exact scotty barnes spotting off from fucking three pascal siakam dribbling the ball um gary Trent jr standing around not moving fred van vliet is running pick and rolls yeah, like i mean the only person who's doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing yeah. all the time is yak and he's the one who's just like perfectly within his own you know he's over himself like he is perfect like I was listening to that interview that he did with Bruce Bruce Bowen. It was just so poetic, like how he talks about himself. He has no ego. It's completely egoless. And he's just like, this is what I needed to do to stay on the court. This is what I I can do a little bit of stuff here. I can do this is the perfect approach to basketball. This is a mental approach. His mental approach to basketball is absolutely perfect. And if the others on his team would lean into his approach to basketball, because he's never talking like I had 20 rebounds i had you know four yeah. blocks he doesn't talk like that no he talks in we and we you know as a team we as a fan base we need a team that thinks in we because as i mentioned before like if you think in we you you play different if it doesn't matter who eats like i can i can create a play for you you can make a play for me we can reverse it now our offense is dynamic the concept of three paul georges really should be the ideal for any team that's building anything out there Try to build a team with three Paul Georges. And I know someone out there is going to clown this and be like, oh, three pandemic peas, ah, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> Fuck off. You know, like it, it's, it's, he is the perfect basketball player in so many ways. Yep. You know, and yeah, like, and, and there's a reason, like, and, you know, it's, it's crazy to say that he's massively underperformed relative to the tag of perfect basketball player. But man, like before he got injured, that oh my god, he lost some injury. So much, he lost so much athleticism. He did, that injury. and there was some legitimate, legitimate talk around the league that he was a top three player at that time. And it yeah. took him so long to get back to being in that conversation as a top three guy. And now he basically, you know, he's just over himself. He's kind of relegated himself to well, I tried to be the guy, it didn't work, and now I'm, you know, Kawhi's the he's guy. He's nowhere and, near as fast as he was in Indiana. Yeah, you know, it's like noticeably, but he's just so crafty and smart and he shoots so well. He gets to where he needs to get to. Yeah. But the, yeah, the threat of the it. shot, the threat of the shot, his shot is so good that yeah. you have to respect it. Yeah. Anyway, Mo, thanks a lot for calling in. This was going to be a short live and now it's turned into a three hour live, but it was a really good conversation. And I think this this went into oh, a lot way, of interesting stuff. Uh, you know, Lillard had was on the um, the podcast. Uh, What's his name? JJ Reddick's yes. podcast. Mm -hmm. Did you watch any of it? Yep, I did. So the part where they were both talking about how the Houston Rockets just basically destroyed the game with numbers. Do you remember that part? Daryl Morey? Yeah, where Lillard was talking about facing the Rockets and him. They were getting good looks. They were getting open mid-range shots. They were getting layups. 
they were getting to the free throw line, but mm-hmm. they weren't chipping into the lead because the Rockets were just hitting you over the head with a barrage of threes. And it was like, it ended up being a numbers game. Like you just, you can't, be, it gets to a point where you can't beat this team. If you don't shoot enough threes, you can't win. It's um, like when the, when yeah. the three point sh- differential in attempts is like 20, it's, it starts to become tough to, to even compete. If they're it's on a really cushion. interesting that the Raptors have completely perfected this idea of taking more shots than their opponent. But you know what's always been interesting to me is how good would this team be? Now, we talk about replacing uh, Pascal Siakam with a legit superstar or Scotty Barnes turning into a legit superstar, right? But let's say, for instance, that of the 80, I don't know, let's say the 20-ish shots that they take more than their opponent actually it's closer to 12 let's say 12 shots that they take more than their opponents right now it's a bevy of layups contested layups twos threes whatever right let's say we converted them all to threes all of them right that that gap has to be all threes so basically what i'm what i'm saying is the raptors take 10 more threes a game even though it's awkward and they often don't make them and whatever would given the shooting variance over a season would that close the gap between them and a team like cleveland or a team like brooklyn right now or even a team maybe not not boston but like a notch below that because i'm telling you man it's close like they're Mm -hmm. losing games pretty close and sometimes it's it's like they took 15 shots more than their opponent and they lost and you're like, how the fuck do you do that? By taking a lot of stupid shots and missing a lot of stupid shots. So if you're going to miss shots because you don't have talent, right? You don't have talent. Um, or you don't have the right talent. Or you don't have the right fit. Or whatever reason you're missing shots. Why don't you just take better shots? Just taking better shots. And and maybe you don't even know how to take better shots. Because if you knew how to do it, you would have done it. So maybe instead of just taking better shots, you just take further out shots. I right? want... Yep, and it's. I think the number one culprit for this is probably Siakam needs to take more threes. Siakam and Scotty need to take more threes. Those two taking more threes, converting some of their long twos, um, and you know contested drives into threes. Like still take mid range shots when they're wide open, or when you're like trying to play make from that position, or if it's like a late clock situation, and that's all you can get. But your first option should pretty much in this in the modern NBA be a three. It's and I know it's awkward, but like that's just how you have to play to win. You I can't don't compete. Think, I don't think Julius Randle's a better player than Pascal Siakam, but his shot distribution is better. Shot he distribution is definitely better, and he's more. He ta- takes like he's more offensively talented. He takes more. I checked the stats. He takes like eight point four threes a game. Siakam takes about four point one. Yes. And Randall's only shooting 35% from three. But well, his see, that's, shooting... that's the thing, right? Like you have Jakob who takes zero. You have Scotty who takes about 3.8 to 4.1. And you have, or that's per 100. I don't know how many how many threes he takes per game. But it's it's around the same as Pascal. If not less. It's less. It's way less. Not way less. No, it's not way but less. it's less. He probably shoots like three a game. I would guess that. Are, are you talking per 100? Are you talking I'm talking about game? his averages a game. Scotty Barnes in 35 minutes he attempts three three pointers a game on the dot in 35 minutes yeah but in terms of his overall shot distribution I don't think that that's that terrible he only attempts 13 shots a game so the fact that three of them are from three should be encouraging if nothing else I mean if you if you if you curb that 13 shot attempts up to like a 26 shot attempt diet well that's six threes a game i agree more of them needs to be threes but yeah i mean look he's already attempted more threes in five fewer games this year than he did last year he's already attempted 205 threes this year yeah right i think the number one guy has to be since he's a better shooter and more advanced shooter is pascal the the four game needs to almost double yeah I don't know about double, Almost. but but I I think you know he and Seven. Scotty like so let's say per I don't know let's say per thirty six minutes now let's use per one hundred possessions to even it out here per one hundred possessions Scotty takes huh okay Scotty takes four point two 
threes per 100 possessions. Okay. So I think he can get that up to six. Okay. He'd be what's, good. What's Pascal's per 100? Let me see here. Siakam per 100 is... Pascal Siakam, five. That so yeah, he can get that him. to eight. So yeah, if he can brutal. get that to eight, and Scotty can get himself three point attempts up to six per one hundred. I think you're good. I think that those that are the would... only two guys I think are turning down shots that they should be taking from three or could take. I think Fred, Gary, and OG basically take all the opportunities they have generally. Wait a second. Think, no, this this this, this was this was career. Hang on one sec, one sec, one sec, one sec. Okay, because that seemed pretty number. low. That seemed pretty low for Pascal. Ah, uh, you you might be surprised, but but yeah, um, per one hundred possessions, five point four. So okay. Scotty's at four point two per one hundred possessions, and Pascal's at five point four. That's actually not a big gap, at all. Per one hundred possessions, well, these numbers actually do not uh, scale badly. Okay, and and Pascal's shooting like three percent better. So, I don't know, man. Like like, okay, like if if Scotty was. And his two point percentage is fifty. They both shoot around the same from two, eh? Yeah. So pa Pascal's fifty point nine percent from two point range. Scotty's forty nine point eight percent from two point range. So yeah, uh, the really the only gap, like like so, their field goal percentage is separated by one point eight percent. It's mainly all the threes. What do you think about she was three point shooting? Like, do you want him taking threes? I do. I think if you're going to play for this team, you have to take threes, unless you're Jakob Pertl. Everyone so has to take threes. You think In order you for him to stay on the court, they have to take threes. Do you think you need to strategically park Achua and, like, Barnes in the corners more often than not? Yes. I, I think right. motion, motion would help. Um, you know, them cutting into open spots, but everyone can't cut into the middle someone has to space and if that guy who's spacing gets an open look he has to take it if you get an open shot you should take it an I open agree. corner three in the nba in 2023 if that is a shot that your offense generated regardless of who is on the court well i don't care if it's me you got to take that shot like everyone's got to take that shot and someone says how would scotty look on golden state warriors um, really great, in my opinion. He's a very smart player. Playing with a guy like Clay, playing with guys like Jordan Poole, yo, like people, people hype up, you know, Jonathan Kaminga. If they had Scotty Barnes instead of Jonathan Kaminga, they'd be so much better off for it. Oh my God, they'd be so good right now. Yeah, the gap between Scotty and Jonathan Kaminga is so big. And the again, fact that they were draft. Yeah. IQ, man. IQ. IQ. Yeah. That's the number one thing, man. Number one. That Kaminga, Achua. It's crazy. Anyway, Coach Mo, I got to go. Uh, yep. But great, great chat. Um, thank you so much to everyone in the chat for... I'm going to the game uh, tomorrow, by the way. I'm going to the game tomorrow. So I'll, yeah? I'll, I'll see uh, how people say um, body language, chemistry, the nice. huddles. Take, yeah, take yeah. some videos. Send them, send them to me on Instagram. <laughs> okay. All right. Cheers, man. Have a good one. Have a good night. Coach Mo at the Raptors game. All right. We're going we're gonna to have a Fred Van Vliet showdown. Um I'm actually going to a Raptor game as well, I believe, on Saturday or Sunday, whenever that is. Um, yeah, so just a quick thing before we exit the chat. Uh, please, if you haven't already, please hit like. Please hit subscribe if you haven't already. Um, big shout out and thank you to Queensway Automotive Group for sponsoring this channel and sponsoring this chat. You're going to see a little bit of their branding on that brick wall behind me. Um, at some point, I'll, I'll work on the um stuff so today i started chatting with them because we do monthly debriefings about how the sponsorship is going and stuff and i just wanted to ask them like what can i tell people about you guys you know like what what more do you want me to say like how's the messaging um and i think that it's really important to for me also to understand what they're doing as a company you know what i mean like i want to understand like what is the appeal why why are you guys um better at what you do than the competitor so, yeah, I mean, it was a really fascinating discussion with Darren and, um, 
hopefully he's going to call into the show one of these days and so he can tell you more about this but it's pretty cool man it's like i'm being sponsored by someone from this community so please make sure to check the affiliate link in the description below if you're looking for a car if you're looking for information on cars if you're looking to sell your car and you don't want to get shafted look we all know about used car salesmen right there's a common trope around the world that used car salesmen should not be trusted well <clears throat> what if a used car what if we could invert that what if we could convert that into you know used car salesman being a really trustworthy person who really knows their shit well that is queensway automotive group so yeah uh make sure to check that link in the description and again thank you so much for hanging with us this is supposed to be a short one turned into a long one i don't know where the conversation went but maybe i should rename this video rob gets a haircut i don't know all right. Take care, guys. Have a good night. Cheers.